first tonight. Hazmat crews from all across our area responded to a chemical leak this afternoon in Rock Island. The chemical was so strong that it was burning through the concrete there. News 8's Christy Mergenthal has the latest. It was just before 1 o'clock Thursday afternoon when hazmat crews were called to the Rock Island water treatment plant for a chemical spill coming from this tanker truck. The chemical hydrofluoral sicilic acid is used to add fluoride to the plant's water. After several hours, crews were able to clean up the leak, allowing operations to return to normal. They had to cordon off the area, obviously, but as far as uh, the treatment of the water and the, the amount of water uh, you know, being used by the public, there's no effect on that at all. Now that acid that did spill out is a chemical that they actually use every single day here at the water treatment plant. It adds fluoride to the water. One of the key questions is, if you run the world and you don't want competition, how do you shut down people's consciousness? How do you do that? Well, you put poisons effectively into the water supply that compromise these gateways of consciousness. And fluoride is one of the most powerful poisons that is routinely used for this purpose. Water fluoridation began in 1945, and it was first implemented in the city of Grand Rapids, Michigan. This has resulted in the loss of medical freedom rights for hundreds of millions of people. Every day, hundreds of millions of people are delivered a dangerous chemical in their tap water that they drink unsuspectingly. That poison is fluoride, and more and more evidence is mounting that it is a toxin, that it does lower IQ. And the detrimental effects of fluoride go on and on and on. This is well documented. Let's cover that here. We started with that local news clip where they were talking about the hazmat team being called in to clean up the hydrofluoric acid. This stuff is gnarly, and it's used to make most fluorine-containing compounds, including Prozac. Here's the material safety data sheet from one manufacturer, Seastar Chemicals, Inc. Potential health effects. Inhalation, ingestion, skin contact, eye contact, skin absorption. May be fatal by ingestion, inhalation, or skin absorption. Corrosive. Acute effects may be delayed. Direct contact with hydrofluoric acid can cause severe and irreversible corrosive injury with possible corneal scarring and blindness if it gets in your eyes. The acid penetrates to deep tissue layers and causes severe corrosive injury. They're using this to add fluoride to the water supply. This is disgusting. And it goes on, of course. Skin and even ingestion may be fatal if swallowed. And you can see it has the red diamond with the skull and bones which I believe means fatal, can be fatal. Here's some photos of burns that people get from this material, from this chemical. This is some gnarly stuff. There have been multiple studies about the effect on developing children that fluoride in the water has. The first one that we'll look at here from 2012, harvard.edu is the website. It says right here, extremely high levels of fluoride are known to cause neurotoxicity in adults and negative impacts on memory and learning have been reported in rodent studies, but little is known about the substance's impact on children's neurodevelopment. Maybe we shouldn't be putting it in the water supply. This is idiotic. This is sinister. It's a huge crime against humanity. And they say that they're actually doing medical interventions on us. They say this is to prevent us from having tooth decay. So they're putting poison in the water. I'm sorry, that's not how medicine works. You need informed consent, especially when you're dosing somebody with poison. So they're violating some of the most basic human rights on a massive scale. Hundreds of millions of people every day are being victimized by this crap. It says here, Harvard School of Public Health and China Medical University in Shenyang for the first time combined 27 studies and found strong indications that fluoride may adversely affect cognitive development in children. The authors say that this risk should not be ignored. More research on fluoride's impact on the developing brain is warranted. You know what else is warranted? Stop this crime against humanity. Stop pouring fluoride into the water. This is insane. This is criminal. And there's a lot of people involved. And even if they don't know that they're harming people, they're still criminally negligent. Dumping this crap in the water. Everybody involved. This is sick stuff.
The average loss in IQ was reported as a standardized weighted mean difference of 0.45, which would be approximately equivalent to 7 IQ points for commonly used IQ scores with a standard deviation of 15. Some studies suggested that even slightly increased fluoride exposure could be toxic to the brain. Oh, you mean like the fluoride you're putting in our water supply, you bastards? This researcher says, Fluoride seems to fit in with lead, mercury, and other poisons that cause chemical brain drain. It says the combined damage on a population scale can be serious, especially because the brain power of the next generation is crucial to us all. Now this is just one example. Let's look at some others. This is on JAMA Pediatrics. Association between maternal fluoride exposure during pregnancy and IQ scores in offspring in Canada. So the mother who's pregnant takes fluoride or not during pregnancy. And then they compare the IQs of the fluoridated versus the organic children. Let's scroll down to the conclusions and relevance. So the conclusion here is, in this study, maternal exposure to higher levels of fluoride during pregnancy was associated with lower IQ scores in children aged 3 to 4. These findings indicate the possible need to reduce fluoride intake during pregnancy. But what are they doing? They're putting it in the water supply without our informed consent. Seemingly with no care in the world that this is going to be dosing people in proportion to how much water they drink. And babies drink a lot of water compared to their body weight compared to adults. Okay, here's another study, BMC Public Health. Fluoride exposure and intelligence in school-aged children, evidence from different windows of exposure susceptibility. Exposure, like they're not adding this stuff to the water supply. It's ridiculous. Background, the intellectual loss induced by fluoride exposure has been extensively studied, yet we add it to the water supply. They're poisoning us. This is not acceptable. And they're doing it under the guise of a medical intervention with every glass of water you take without your informed consent. This is criminal stuff. Conclusions. Prenatal and childhood excessive fluoride exposures may impair the intelligence development of school children. Furthermore, children with prenatal fluoride exposure had lower IQ scores than children who were not prenatally exposed. So the obvious conclusion is we shouldn't be giving the children poison in their water supply. This is sick stuff. And here's another article I found, this one on NIH.gov, about potential fluoride toxicity from oral medicine. And it goes through a lot of stuff. It doesn't bode well for fluoride, poison in the water, and in tooth products. But I found this chart, which was interesting. Acute effects of fluoride. Nausea, vomiting, hypocalcemia. Tetany, especially of hand and feet, hypotension, hypersalivation, mixed metabolic and respiratory acidosis due to failure of renal respiratory system, coma and convulsions leading to death, and then chronic effects, dental fluorosis, skeletal fluorosis, hypersensitivity reactions, dyspepsia, gastric irritation, insufficiency of renal system, numbness, muscular spasm, birth defects, and cancer. And it goes into a lot more detail, but we have a lot to get through. But what happens when you search Google for fluoride in the water? Oh, look here. They're giving recommendations. You want to have enough fluoride in drinking water to a level recommended for preventing tooth decay. So where's the discussion about informed consent violation? Why is fluorine in water? Oh, to reduce tooth decay, it says in bold. It says solely to reduce tooth decay. So it's a medical intervention. That's what they're saying. It's a horrible argument. It's poisonous. It's toxic. And they say it reduces decay. So they're treating people's teeth. That's what they're saying they're doing. Well, the government can't treat people without their informed consent. It's a clear violation, not just of the Nuremberg Code, but of basic human decency. You don't poison people in your country. That's insanity. So they don't even claim it's to clean the water or anything. They say it's solely there to reduce tooth decay. That's so dumb on its face. But I think it's a lie, as we'll cover here. CDC.gov, community water fluoridation. Drinking fluoridated water keeps teeth strong and reduces cavities. And then here's harvard.edu again. Is fluoridated drinking water safe? 
I haven't even read this one yet. But hopefully they'll take into account this other article that they put out saying it reduces people's IQ scores by seven. And then here's the American Dental Association. We know that they're all gung-ho about fluoridating our water and our bodies. It's not water treatment. It's people treatment. They're trying to give people treatment for their teeth is what they're saying. So Google, of course, is rigging the results to promote poison in the water. Just making historical note of this. Here's that article that was linked up in the results. American Cancer Society. Does fluoride cause cancer? A study of lab animals reported by the U.S. National Toxicology Program in 1990 found equivocal evidence of cancer-causing potential of fluoridated drinking water in male rats based on higher-than-expected number of cases of osteoscarcoma, a type of bone cancer. So we're going to cover a lot more effects of fluoride in this documentary, but I want to remind people of this quote by John D. Rockefeller. He said, I don't want a nation of thinkers. I want a nation of workers. He doesn't want a nation of thinkers. Could that be why there's a substance added to our water supply that makes people dumb? Think about this, folks. Fluoride is safe and effective, and it's one of the most inexpensive ways to really cut down on dental decay. Anything we can do to help prevent cavities on children, I think, is very important. Absolutely, fluoride is safe. It's effective. Fluoridation of community water is extremely safe and extremely effective in preventing tooth decay. Science is on the side of fluoride being safe and effective. There is no controversy about this in the scientific community. If it's such a simple issue, how is it that it's still going on after half a century? I remember it being debated yeah, well, I 30 agree. years ago. And, and it's continuous to debate. Uh, public health officials knew then what they know now would we have fluoride? Would it be added to our drinking water? Well, today, a coalition of scientists, dentists, and doctors are taking action to stop fluoridation until it is proven safe. We don't put other things in the water to try to keep everybody's blood pressure down or everybody's stroke risk down. And there's no reason why we should be trying a one-size-fits-all approach for this either. Once you put a, a medicine in the drinking water, you can't control the dose because you can't control how much water people drink. You can't control who gets it, it goes to everybody. If you ask a pharmacist if there's any drug in his store that was safe enough to give to everyone, young people, old people, sick people, people with poor nutrition, give it to them in any dose, they'd laugh at you. It's ridiculous. There's no way you can give out a medicine without being able to control the dose. And one dose cannot fit all and you can't give a medicine to everybody. You are forcing it on people who don't want it. There are people in this audience who've spent far more time researching this issue, including David, myself, and many other people in this audience. And they stated categorically to the mayor, to the city councillors, we do not want you to force this medicine on us. We have the right to informed consent to medication. That's a very important right. This is a violation. It's being violated every day in this country to over 200 million people. There needs to be informed consent. We have that with all other medications. When we go to the doctor, he or she gives us the information of what the side effects are gonna be. With fluoride, there is no informed consent. There is no safe dose for one size, this one size fits all medication that they're doing to us. Now, all of those issues are important, but the one that really concerns me is the impact of fluoride on the brain. The, a study panel for the EPA listed fluoride as amongst 109 chemicals for which there was significant evidence of neurological effects. It has a definite impact on the neurons, which is the nerve parts of the brain. You don't just grow those back. It's not like, well, I cut myself, so now I'm renewing my cell. It doesn't happen to the neurons. There are so many ways that fluoride could be damaging the brain. We know this from animal studies. Dr. Phyllis Moulinex exposed rats to fluoride to work out its effects on the human brain and the central nervous system. What we did was we exposed them, let them drink the fluoride in the water for six to 20 weeks. The pattern that we saw it typically is what we see with other neurotoxic agents that are well known to cause a hypoactivity or uh, a memory problem or an IQ problem. When I first presented the results of these studies, one of the uh, 
individual sitting and listening to the results. He says, do you have any idea what you're saying? And he says, you're telling us that we're reducing the IQ of children. Look, the first opponents of fluoridation in this country in the 1950s were biochemists. These biochemists had used fluoride in their experiments to poison enzymes. And they, including Dr. James Sumner, who won the Nobel Prize for Enzyme Chemistry at Cornell, and he said, fluoride poisons enzymes. You don't want to put this substance into the body. Poisoning enzymes is what makes people sick. Poisoning enzymes is what kills people. It's highly likely that you're going to get subtle effects on the brain that the parent is not going to notice. No wonder that our children can't read and write. It's no wonder because we're damaging their brains with a stupid preventive dentistry program that doesn't even work. We have behavioral studies and we have 24 IQ studies, 24 studies which now show an association between fairly modest exposure to fluoride and lowered IQ. They've actually got it down to a one milligram dose of fluoride causes a 0.59 loss in IQ points. The average IQ is 100. So if you're 95, you're in the back of the class napping because you can't understand what the person in the front is saying and you're gonna get a nice job pushing the broom around. So what if you got twice that dose? Okay, you're down to 90. So what they showed in studies in other countries is that you lose all your genius out of your society. You damage the intellect. But new research from China supports Dr. Mullenex's conclusion that fluoride affects mental development and IQ levels. I've heard a great deal about a chemical that can be used on the teeth to help prevent decay. Is that a good thing to use? It certainly is. We use a fluoride solution, and we have evidence that for some people... Fifty years ago, American government scientists had clinical evidence that fluoride affected the central nervous system. But all this was kept secret. Chemical? You're going to put some chemical in my mouth? Because the study is basically saying that pregnant women uh, who drink fluoridated water, uh, there is an obvious connection with lowered IQ in their babies. Yes. So yes. that indicts the entire practice of fluoridating water supplies, which, by the way, in case people haven't caught on yet, is a medical treatment, medical treatment, that is imposed upon a great percentage of the population without their consent. Yes, and that's a very important part. And, and you're talking about there is no uh, uh, discussion of the damage that's been done to people for the last, well, they said uh, 1950. So we're looking at about 70 years. You know, 1945, they said it was when it first began. So we got about 70 years of this, uh, 70 years of uh, lowering people's IQ. No apology for that. And we've already seen the Harvard study that was in China that looked at the effect on IQ of children, uh, not just uh, when they were be when they were developing in the womb, but after birth as they're growing up. And the damage to them was even more significant than what was measured in this JAMA story. And that was Harvard. Yeah. So you see what happens. The story surfaces and then it disappears. Mm -hmm. So there's mm -hmm. not going to be any real follow up here. It's not going to be as if uh, JAMA is going to suddenly uh, turn around and say, well, now, as journalists, we have to do an ongoing series of articles exposing and revealing the depth of the damage that's been caused, what can be done about it, if anything, and how we have to stop fluoridating at this point completely. You're not going to see what any average person would do if they were the editor of that journal. The story appears. It's going to sink. The fluoridating forces are going to continue to try to keep fluoridating. That's and right. uh, it's going to be completely insane. So people have to get up on their hind legs in their local communities, which, by the way, can rule against fluoridation and knock it out. Yes. And the editor at uh, JAMA was saying the same thing, basically, sort of on the level of, oh, gee, I don't want to really publish this 
because it's going to stir up conspiracy theorists. Mm -hmm. No, it's going to stir up people who learn the truth. That's, That's the right. actual fact of the matter. So, uh, you know, as you say, they're pouring cold water on this from the beginning. They're trying to soften the blow. They're trying to uh, pretend that everything is okay, basically, when everything is not okay. And uh, I just want to reinforce the, the fact that at the local level, that's where fluoridation measures are passed. At the community level, the town, the village, the city, et cetera, et cetera, that's where it occurs. You have to have councils, city councils and legislatures at the local level voting to fluoridate the water in order to make it happen. And therefore, the, the people can exert pressure to unfluoridate and to say, no, 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 we're not going to do this anymore. Here's the study. Are you people saying that you really want to poison all of our children and lower their IQs? Is that what you're saying? Because that's what you're going to do if you fluoridate. Now, Dr. Burke, uh, your research shows that uh, if all of the United States had been fluoridated, that would mean uh, about 70,000 extra deaths because of cancer per annum. Those are remarkable, impressive, and in fact, rather disquieting figures. Could you shortly describe your research in this field and what results did you get from it? Yes. The 70,000, of course, represents, would represent one-fifth of all the cancer deaths in the United States, twice as many from breast cancer in women and twice as many as from lung cancer in man. Uh, to our studies involve comparing the deaths of all persons in the 10 largest fluoridated cities of the United States with the 10 largest non-fluoridated cities in the United States year by year. And we obtained a very remarkable curve, which you can see here perhaps. Here is the fluoridated and here is the non-fluoridated set of 10 cities each. Before, here's where the fluoridation started. And before this time, both sets of cities were identical. But no sooner had fluoridation started than this curve began to go up. The deaths began to increase so that this effect occurs very promptly within one, two, or five years. Now this, sir, is conclusive evidence that fluor kills because of cancer. It is one of the most conclusive bits of scientific and biological evidence that I have come across in my 50 years in the field of cancer research. Would this then, in your opinion, be the end of fluor in water, in drinking water? It should be the end, and in the United States, it should so be the end by federal law known as the Delaney Amendment, which says that anything found to induce cancer in man or animals cannot be legally put into the food or drink of man or animals. And so, uh, and this is all less than one year old, so that it entirely changes any previous ideas of fluoridation that anyone may have had, because this is the first real indication of an important effect. Now, in, uh, in, in this country, of course, the state of the, uh, the dental state of the Union, the way people's teeth look, is incredible indeed. Would you say that uh, stopping fluor had other effects than increasing the dental problems in this country? Well, I would rather look at it that it would certainly help the cancer death situation in this country which I'm sure most people would agree is far more important than a temporary benefit to teeth in adolescent children. Now, uh, this, this, you see, amounts to public murder on a grand scale. It is a public crime, it would be, to put fluoride in the drinking water of people. Now, the children of this cameraman and mine, sir, Take fluor. Should we stop this immediately? 
Well, in my opinion, if they were my children, uh, they would not take it anymore. I can only recommend for myself, but I would suggest to you that they stop it. Is there a difference uh, in having fluor in drinking water or administering little fluor pills to children? Well, of course, the little fluor pills are a much smaller proposition than drinking gallons of water per day or per week, as well as taking a bath in it and washing your automobile in it, watering your lawns. That's a very massive thing compared to uh, brushing teeth with fluoridated toothpaste. But uh, our work is immediately concerned with drinking water. What happens to toothpaste, I'm quite willing to uh, let the future studies go into that in more detail. The whole thing started with the Manhattan Project to produce mm -hmm. an atomic bomb on the East Coast. And the fluoride uh, was a waste product of that uh, gargantuan process which started to leak out into the environment, New Jersey, Delaware, etc., destroying farms, killing animals, etc., etc. And so the, the original lawsuits against the Manhattan Project didn't really have anything to do with radiation, had to do with fluorides. And so the people who were in charge said, well, we have to mount a PR campaign that's going to be successful and convince people, <coughs> excuse me, that fluorides are not only safe, but they're beneficial. What can we do? And somebody piped up and said, well, let's say, for example, that it's great for dental health. We can send out lecturers all over the country telling people that fluorides are wonderful for dental health. And that's exactly what they did. And that's the way it got to be the way it is now. Yeah, and I don't buy that either because, you know, if you get an overdose of fluoride, it's a condition called fluorosis of your bones. It actually uh, eats holes in them, right, John? Exactly. Exactly. I mean, we're not even getting into some of the deeper uh, adverse effects, as they like to call them, of fluorides. We're just talking about the lowering of IQ, which is in itself mm -hmm. horrendous. Mm -hmm. But there are many more uh, very dangerous effects from fluorides that have been confirmed in the literature. It's there. It's just been covered up. Fluoride. It is hailed by the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention as one of the 10 great public health achievements of the 20th century. In fact, for over 60 years, the American Dental Association has stated that brushing with fluoride toothpaste will prevent tooth decay. Triumph over tooth decay. Procter & Gamble announces Crest Toothpaste with Floristan, its exclusive fluoride compound, world's greatest weapon against decay. Look, Mom, no cavities. Yes, Crest toothpaste really cuts down cavities because Crest has fluoride. The same fluoride dentists put right on teeth to prevent decay. With Crest, you put this fluoride on your teeth at home, too. Prevent cavities. Use Crest. Crest is accepted by the American Dental Association. Today, 95% of the toothpaste sold in the United States contains fluoride. And 72% of all water is fluoridated. The first widespread commercial use of fluoride was for the eradication of vermin. Since the 1800s, sodium fluoride has been a key ingredient in rat poison and insecticides. These products were commonly used in and around the home to kill lice, mice, rats, and insects. Fluoride proved to be not only a good way to kill rodents, but also an effective way to kill a man. As the use of fluoride became more popular, reports began flooding in of people dying from ingesting this toxic substance. Headlines screamed. Roach poisoned in pancakes kills 11 men. Rancher takes dose of poison by mistake. Article after article, all having the same tragic endings, proving that sodium fluoride can and does indeed cause death. In fact, during the last part of the 19th century, the Industrial Revolution was taking hold of the modern world. An unfortunate byproduct of this technological revolution was that it created the most toxic pollutants known to man. And the most hazardous and destructive of them all was fluoride. In his award-winning book, The Fluoride Deception, investigative journalist Christopher Bryson examines fluoride's disturbing history. 
Bryson notes that in its early days, fluoride was a widely known and well-documented killer. Documentation from early lawsuits against fluoride manufacturers clearly shows that fluoride was a hazard, not only to humans, but to the environment as well, with damages reaching into the tens of millions of dollars. By 1930, the aluminum industry was the largest and most influential fluoride polluter. Industrial giants such as Alcoa knew they had to do something. Vegetation and livestock near Alcoa plants were being decimated as toxic fluoride fumes lingered, rendering nearby cattle lame and crippled, even causing death. One newspaper article from that time proclaimed, During the past year, we had 51 head of cattle die. We had laboratory tests made, and these tests show excessive amounts of fluorine in the liver and kidneys. Also, some of our young cows had lost their teeth. Our saddle horses were so crippled from fluorine poisoning, they had to be shot. The serious nature of fluoride toxicity was beginning to be realized. As a result, fluoride's threat to corporate America was laid out in an exhaustive review conducted by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Toxicologist Floyd Dietz warned of new medical information exposing fluoride's harmful effects. Danish scientist Kaj Roholm singled out the aluminum industry, specifically Alcoa, as the source of much of the fluoride poisoning. Fluoride was causing irreparable damage, and the word was getting out. Alcoa knew they had to act fast. Their high-powered attorneys sprung into action, quickly buying up farms and paying out settlements. Ironically enough, during that time, the U.S. Public Health Service was under the jurisdiction of the United States Treasury Secretary, Andrew W. Mellon. Mellon was the founder and major stockholder of Alcoa. He was also the founder of the Mellon Institute, an industry-funded research institute that was notorious for giving corporations, such as Alcoa, the scientific data they needed to defend themselves against lawsuits. The Mellon Institute published questionable and self-serving evidence that supported the effectiveness of fluoride in fighting tooth decay. In doing so, the Mellon Institute rats had put a smiling face on what had been a scientifically recognized environmental and workplace poison. It was an aluminum industry-funded scientist, Dr. Gerald Cox, who worked at the Mellon Institute that first made the proposal to artificially fluoridate public water supplies. Mellon's economic interest in fluoridation was obvious. Fluoridation provided the chemical industry an opportunity to void liability of their poisonous fluoride waste by means of promoting it as a health benefit. The official human experiments began in Grand Rapids, Michigan on January 25, 1945. 107 barrels of sodium fluoride were delivered to Grand Rapids, where city technicians began tipping them into the city's water supply. They were the first to publicly fluoridate their water. It was to serve as the test city, and its tooth decay rates were to be compared with those of non-fluoridated Muskegon. The study only lasted five years. There are no permanent teeth in a child born at the beginning of the study. It was an unblinded study. They did no measure of safety, and they claimed that there was a tremendous benefit to the permanent teeth. Well, there weren't any permanent teeth in the children that were born at the beginning of the study. And soon thereafter, they fluoridated Muskegon, the control city. It's a phony baloney study used to demonstrate the benefits where there are none. Unfortunately, fluoride's ugly side has almost entirely escaped the public view. As Bryson points out, historians have failed to record that fluoride pollution was in fact the biggest legal worry of the industries that were involved in developing the atomic bomb program. As some may remember, the Manhattan Project was a secret program which brought the atomic bomb into existence. But what most people are totally unaware of is the fact that fluoride was an essential element in the production of the atom bomb. It was a guy named Harold Hodge that was a chief toxicologist for the Manhattan Project. And basically, in order to create the nuclear weapons, they needed massive, massive amounts of fluoride. He was hired as a toxicologist or part of the team to determine is there going to be any toxic effects of fluoride in this project. Really what they were worried about is they were worried about lawsuits. They knew that there was negative effects of fluoride. They had to basically invent this whole scheme so they could use the high levels of fluoride in the Manhattan Project to create atomic and nuclear weapons. 
For more than 70 years, the Public Health Service has assured society that fluoridation is safe and effective. These assurances have largely rested on the results of the 1945 Newburgh Kingston Fluoride Caries Trial. This study compared the safety of fluoride in drinking water for two New York cities, one fluoridated, the other not fluoridated. The impetus for the first fluoridated city, Grand Rapids, was born from this study. However, recently declassified documents show that this study was a complete fabrication. A trail of declassified Manhattan Project papers unearthed by investigative journalist Christopher Bryson showed that the toxicology department at the University of Rochester, which was under the direction of Harold Hodge, secretly monitored the Newburgh experiment to, quote, supply evidence useful in the litigation arising from an alleged loss of a fruit crop. In fact, these once restricted documents reveal that as far back as 1944, the Manhattan Project was spending money on toxicology studies on fluoride. Why? Because fluoride was the key ingredient used in the process of enriching uranium. Enriched uranium was the linchpin of the U.S. military's fledgling nuclear weapons program. Fluoride became a national security issue. The declassified documents suggest that Newburgh was simply another human experiment, one used to justify the interests and advancement of the nuclear industrial state. The final report of Newburgh concluded that small concentrations of fluoride were safe. Yet documents reveal that the top fluoride scientist in the U.S., Dr. H. Trendley Dean, known as the father of fluoridation, secretly opposed the experiment, fearing that fluoride's toxicity would be revealed. Until now, Dean's dissent on Newburgh has never been made public. There's irrefutable evidence that the U.S. military the Manhattan Project, the makers of the atomic bomb, concealed evidence of fluoride's harm to their workers, to the community, and to the American public. One study was published in the journal of the American Dental Association in 1948 by Dale. In these files, Manhattan Project Captain Peter Dale at the University of Rochester reported preliminary results of dental investigations among laboratory fluoride workers at Columbia University. He concluded that fluoride did not prevent cavities in the 95 laboratory workers examined. Quote, their teeth seemed to be deteriorating rapidly, and their gums bled more freely. In fact, most of the hydrofluoric acid workers examined had few or no teeth left. They were in large part toothless or nearly toothless. This information, however, was left out of the published version. The published study merely notes that the fluoride workers had fewer cavities than did the unexposed workers. They didn't mention the fact that they had fewer cavities because their teeth had fallen out of their mouths. Since World War II, fluoride has been one of the most destructive environmental pollutants. At one point during the Cold War, fluoride was blamed for more damage claims against industry than all 20 other major air pollutants combined. Fluoride was responsible for one of the most notorious environmental disasters in U.S. history, the town of Donora, Pennsylvania which jump-started the environmental movement. In 1948, the small mill town lost 20 people, and an estimated 6,000 men, women, and children were sickened by U.S. Steel's dark blanketing smog. Even the town's name betrayed its corporate roots. Donora was an amalgam of the first name of Nora Mellon, the wife of industrialist Andrew W. Mellon. After the Halloween disaster in Donora, Pennsylvania, Philip Stadler, a chemist, went to Denar, and he was able to test and measure and prove that it was fluoride that had caused all those deaths. Sadler quickly went public. Article after article ran the story. Chemist says fluorine gas caused 19 smog deaths. Sadler said, chronic fluorine poisoning has been killing people in Denora for a long time. It has left its characteristic trademark on the valley's animals, crops, and vegetation. Both the U.S. Army and the Atomic Energy Commission, now known as the Energy Department, had a secret and vital interest in the outcome of the Donora disaster. If fluoride were fingered for the Donora deaths, it might bring unwanted scrutiny of worker health safety for those in the bomb factories, resulting in damage suits and expensive requirements for air pollution controls. On October 1949, the Public Health Service official report on Donora was released. The 173-page government document appeared to be of similar size to that of the Holy Bible and came to virtually no conclusions. 
The report's emphasis was on bad weather and that the disaster was therefore an act of God. The report made no mention of fluoride. Could it be there was a vested interest on the part of the government not to upset the public concerning the potential dangers of fluoride? Although it was Gerald Cox's idea that ultimately led to the endorsement of water fluoridation, the man who gave the official endorsement was Federal Security Administrator Oscar R. Ewing, Alcoa's top Wall Street attorney. Nine months after the Denora disaster, Ewing made a surprise announcement for the nation. The U.S. Public Health Service was reversing a long-held position. The ex-Alcoa lawyer declared that his agency now favored adding fluoride to drinking water across the United States. Coincidence? When it came time to choose a public relations representative to persuade public opinion in favor of water fluoridation, Ewing chose none other than the father of public relations himself, Edward Bernays. When they're selling water fluoridation, they didn't just walk out and say it's good for you. They actually hired Edward Bernays, Sigmund Freud's nephew, to sell Americans on how good it was to have silica fluoride in the water. Edward Bernays was the one that created how to control the population through media and through advertising. Edward Bernays, also known as the father of spin, pioneered the idea of crowd psychology. In 1928, he wrote a book called Propaganda, in which he wrote, If we understand the mechanism and motives of the group mind, is it not possible to control and regiment the masses according to our will, without their knowing it? He called it the engineering of consent. People like Bernays, you know, were masters of social engineering. His entire thesis, if you will, is that you don't talk to the public in a rational, scientific way. Instead, you appeal to their emotions and you invoke their fears. He was key in getting women to start smoking. He positioned cigarettes as being sexy and individualistic and, you know, power to the woman. That was the, the framing of why women should start smoking. A consumerist culture was born and the United States government took notice. U.S. agencies soon adopted Bernays' techniques of manipulation to manufacture the fear of ever-present danger in the minds of the people, to give those in power greater control of what Bernays called the mass mind. He went on to propose in his book Propaganda, those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government which is the true ruling power of our country. We are governed, our minds are molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested, largely by men we have never heard of. This statement holds just as true today as it did in the 20s when Bernays first wrote it. Throughout medical science, including dentistry, poison-producing corporations have always been able to infiltrate major institutions and dominate their narrative. When Christopher Bryson was writing this book, the fluoride deception, he reached out to Edward Bernays. Bernays said it was child's play to convince the American public that fluoride was good for them. While the official narrative rang, the case for fluoride had been proven. Some people weren't so quick to jump on the fluoridation bandwagon. Because fluoride had been used for years as a rat poison to kill coyotes, to kill cockroaches. Some of those opposing fluoridation were in fact dentists. And because of their advocacy for safe water, they were censored by the American Dental Association. If they worked for the Public Health Service, they got fired. If they were team players and kept their mouth shut, they got to keep their job. So out of fear, many people who knew better remained silent. The true story behind water fluoridation can be hard to swallow. The facelift performed on fluoride dating back more than 60 years ago has misled generations. Instead of conjuring up the image of a crippled worker or a poisoned forest, we see smiling children. To say things like, tobacco is harmless, fluoride is harmless. Agent Orange is harmless, they say. DDT was harmless. Asbestos, right? Yeah, GMOs now, they say, are harmless. This is a long history of science selling out to corporate interests while the people are systematically poisoned. And to this day, people still believe fluoride is safe in the drinking water, and the majority of dentists still believe it's safe 
to put in toothpaste and to put in uh, different types of compounds. Most people in America are persuaded that everybody fluoridates their water. And you, if you're living in a town like Albany or Long Island or Ithaca or somewhere, but the vast majority of the population of the world does not drink fluoridated water. Most of the countries do not fluoridate the water, only about 30. The countries now that have banned the use of fluoride, uh, China, Austria, Belgium, Finland, Germany, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, the Netherlands, Hungary, and Japan. These, all these countries have said that fluoride, number one, is ineffective and toxic and should not be used. We are still using it. There's something wrong here. I think it's time that uh, we become aware and do something about it. How come our country that's supposed to be, quote, so smart, uses it. Well, there's something going on here. What does the European Union know that we don't know? Nothing. Nothing. They know the same thing, that's why. But the difference is they're not getting paid off, and we are. And so, therefore, this is what the only thing I can come up with, because they both have the same facts. They both have the same facts. Fluoride is toxic. Fluoride is not helping your teeth. If it was really helping your teeth, why do we have all these dental problems? It's not at all. How come you can go to primitive societies around the world that never had even seen fluoride, and they have perfect teeth? Why are we having all these learning disorders? How come we're having autism? We're having all these things we never had before. Well, why don't we ask that question and answer it honestly? Answer it honestly. 98% of Europe does not fluoridate. Only eight countries in the world have more than 50% of their population drinking water. America, Australia, New Zealand, Ireland, Israel, Singapore, Malaysia, and Colombia. Only eight. I think Europeans have come to their senses on, on several issues, not all of them, but on many. GMOs being one of them and fluoride being another. They've rejected these things because they're looking at the evidence. America tends to be way behind the curve on really recognizing reality in the realm of, of fraudulent hoax science. Our CDC and the liars in Washington, D.C. have only had success in countries that speak English for the vast majority of the disposal of their hazardous waste product. That means that you and I and our children in the United States are the largest consumers of hydrofluosilicic acid. Call it what it is. Hydrofluosilicic acid. What is that? Hydro is water, fluo, fluoride, silicic, sand, and it's missing an electron. It's acidic. It'll kill you. You take your hand dipping in like that and you're going to die. Hydrofluosilicic acid does not occur in nature. It's a man-made molecule. And it eats through concrete, glass, stainless steel, fiberglass, plastic. You name it, it'll eat it. So why are we putting that in the water? What is labeled fluoride is not naturally occurring fluoride, like you might find in the ground. It's actually a collection. It can be over 100 different chemicals, including some radioactive chemicals, including many cancer-causing chemicals, including heavy metals, uh, neurologically damaging elements that are called fluoride. And then this is dumped into the water supply, and the cities have the doctors and dentists convinced that this is somehow good for your teeth. Fluoride is really a clever way for industry, the mining industry, the chemical processing industries, aluminum smelting and processing industries, to eliminate their toxic industrial waste without having to pay for it to be handled as industrial waste. They just slap a new label on it, fluoride. They sell it to cities, and the cities dump it into the water supply. Basically, it's a hazardous waste byproduct of the manufacture of phosphate fertilizer. It's a mining byproduct. They dig up this rock. This rock is no good, as is. So you mix it with sulfuric acid, and this produces soluble phosphate. And that's what becomes the fertilizer. It's a byproduct that they can't do anything with. It's a poison. So they sell it and make fluoride out of it. It was a fraud. It was a scam from the get-go. It is a means of getting rid of fluoride. You allow 
industry to use your water supply to dispose of their hazardous waste. It's a disposal mechanism. It's an industrial, a major industrial waste pollutant. They were trying to dump it into the rivers that were going out into the ocean in Florida. And boy, they stopped that. They said, you're polluting, you're killing the fish, you're, and which they were. For a hundred years, they decimated the local vegetation, crippled the cattle, damaged the citrus groves in Florida. It was costing them a fortune to handle this as a very serious industrial waste. And so they're helping Cargill get rid of their hazardous waste problems. Cargill is the largest privately owned corporation in the world. They were also the largest producer of hydrofluorosilicic acid. Cargill at one time had like 90% of the market. When the hurricanes went through Florida, they knocked out the holding ponds, so there was a shortage of hydrofluorosilicic acid. And so they reached out to the rest of the world, and now we get it from Mexico and Japan and China, because none of those countries allow fluoride in the water supply. They don't, they don't put it in at all, so it obviously it's piling up in those countries. I don't think we need to be helping other countries out with their disposal of fluorosilicic acid. Fluoridation is the worst recycling practice in the world, so I support recycling. But to take the hazardous waste from the phosphate fertilizer industry, which cannot be dumped into the sea by international law, and cannot be used locally because it's too concentrated, and to take that product and put it into our public drinking water is sheer lunacy. There are 250,000 tons dumped annually in the water supply. Does that sound like a big figure to you? If you had one ton and were worth over a million dollars, you'd be a poor person by the time you got rid of that ton. It's extremely expensive to get rid of. When you digest phosphate rock with sulfuric acid, that's what you're going to give off, hydrogen fluoride and silicon tetrafluoride. Now, even at that strength, it'll eat up concrete, asphalt, stainless steel, even the fume ducts after a while, which is made out of fiberglass. Very corrosive, the most corrosive acid known to man. Used to etch glass, it's used for a lot of things. Uh, one of the things it's used for is to fluoridate drinking water. Who in the world would want to drink water with this stuff in it? The city of Dallas, Texas, like many cities across the nation, spends millions of dollars on contracts with companies like Cargill, Mosaic, and Penco to fluoridate the region's water supply. On Mosaic's website, the product listed for use in water fluoridation is actually called hydrofluorosilicic acid. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration, otherwise known as OSHA, is a U.S. agency that requires companies to produce a material safety data sheet, or an MSDS, for every chemical product in the market. The MSDS that Mosaic produces for their fluoride product will make your hair stand on end. Right here I have the Mosaic material safety data sheet on their hydrofluorosilicic acid product. A material safety data sheet is a very important document to disclose safety and health issues about possible exposure to this chemical. The MSDS sheet is supposed to inform you about what is this chemical, what's in it. So what we find in the case of the Mosaic, their hydrofluorosilicic acid, is that it is not a pharmaceutical grade product, it is an industrial grade chemical and under section 2 hazard identification it identifies a health hazard as being corrosive to the skin the eyes and the mucous membranes if you come in contact with it uh, through the skin or inhalation or ingestion uh, such as swallowing it it may cause severe irritation and burns and so on the second page it identifies potential health effects and it mentions that it's corrosive to the eye, uh, corrosive to the skin, corrosive uh, uh, through inhalation such as breathing, corrosive if you swallow it. In this they're, they're basically giving these health effects due to hydrofluorosilicic acid and a high concentration. It's less clear at, at what concentration this won't happen at. As a chemist, I've looked at scores of material safety data sheets and never in my career have I seen a warning for children 
in an MSDS, Material Safety Data Sheet. What happens is the companies that's producing this chemical realizes they have a revenue stream that's a little risky for them from a liability standpoint on how their customers are using this chemical. And so they've now put a warning in their material safety data sheet, warning um, for fluorosis, osteosclerosis, if exposure occurs during enamel formation. There are no children working in these chemical plants. There's no, there are no children being chemical handlers. So this warning is for the end user. And so we presented this to the city council and they have now been alerted that their own supplier has put a warning. And this is where we came across and said, you now need to put a warning, at least for children that you've received from your supplier, you need to put that downstream. So now the liability is on them too. Hydrofluorosic acid has no known benefit in human or any physiological system. It's not even useful in any mammal. So adding that to the public water supply for an alleged benefit is a fraud and it's a crime against the citizens of this country and it's cumulative over a lifetime. It is a very noxious poison and you do not have to take my word for it. If you've got a Webster's Dictionary, open it up. It, one of the definitions is fluoride, a violent protoplasmic poison. Then you have to go look up protoplasm. We are protoplasm. So. Violent protoplasm for us. Say, let's put that in the water and see how the kids turn out. As we're learning, there it seems like there are no rewards to this. It just seems, it's just all risks. It's all risk. It's a big lie. There's no benefit whatsoever. It's all risk. Let's get to the science. That's what I say. Yeah. Instead of covering it up, let's look at the science. What do these fluoride chemicals actually do to human beings? There's all kinds of research out there showing it really disturbs the functioning of the body in a number of ways. Uh, inactivates 62 enzymes, increases the aging process, increases the incidence of cancers and tumors up to 17%, disrupts the immune system, causes genetic damage, interrupts RNA and DNA, repair enzymes activity, increases arthritis, and is a system poison. These are all validated by scientific data. We have in America today all of the symptoms of hypothyroidism, uh, obesity, heart disease, neurological impairment. I have been very sick. I was diagnosed with hypothyroidism about 10 years ago. There was no family history in my background that explained why I had this thyroid illness. What were some of your side effects? Feeling very cold, um, hair loss, uh, concentration issues. It really controls your metabolism. So I, was, I had gained about 10 to 15 pounds, which is very unusual. I was very athletic my whole life and never was overweight. So I gained weight. I was sleeping a lot. Again, your metabolism is tuned down. Doing the research, fluoride is an uh, irritant to your thyroid. Your thyroid wants iodine. And if it doesn't get iodine at the concentrations that it needs, then it gets whatever is closest that you're providing in the environment. But if you look at the periodic table, you see that fluoride, chlorine, bromine, and iodine are all in the same column. That means they have very similar electronic structure and reactivity. So that's why your thyroid will uptake fluoride and chlorine when you're not giving it enough iodine. The pineal gland is actually kind of located in the center of the brain and it secretes two hormones, DMT and melatonin. Melatonin actually regulates your sleep cycles and it's kind of like a feel-good hormone which also helps regulate your puberty and it helps regulate all your hormone structures inside your system. In 1997, Jennifer Luke published her PhD thesis on fluoride in the pineal gland. In her dissertation, she conducted animal studies and concluded that fluoride exposure has been found to cause early puberty in females. Similar findings have been reported in two epidemiological studies of human populations that are drinking fluoridated water. The first study was conducted in 1945 during the Newburgh versus Kingston fluoridation trial. It was discovered that girls in fluoridated Newburgh were reaching menstruation on average five months earlier than the girls in unfluoridated Kingston but the result was not thought to be significant at the time. In 1983, another study was conducted in which a man with the last name of Farkas reported that girls living in highly fluoridated towns began their first menstruation cycles at a much younger age than girls living in less fluoridated areas. 
when the pineal gland is calcified, it causes an onset of puberty. In my documentary, Crippling Waters, one of the ladies in there, we called her the star, a nine-year-old girl, take a look at her. Does she look nine? She's exposed to high fluoride in her family's well water. Her dad, who's only 20 years older, is starting to bend over like this and starting to become crippled. He can't put his hands above his head. The calcification of the pineal gland is an adaptive process so that that child can have babies by the time she's 14 because she's going to be crippled by the time she's 40. Fluoride's role in earlier puberty needs more thorough investigation. When one considers the seriousness of a possible interference by fluoride on a growing child's pineal gland, it underlines the negative and dangerous effects of fluoridation. Dave, so what we're learning is kind of frightening because it seems to me that once it's in your body, it's, is it there to stay? Yes, you can't get it out. You can cut some of the harm by mitigating the damage and avoid it like the plague, but you really can't get it out because it's stuck in your bones. And that's why you have all the skeletal symptoms, you know, the, the joint pain, the arthritis, and all that stuff. The first signs that fluoride is poison your bones is pains in the joints, stiffness in the joints, pains in the bones. Well, you go to the doctor with pain in a joint, he says, oh, you got arthritis. Well, arthritis, arth, joint, rightus, pain. Oh, okay, joint pain. So we got somebody speaking to us in Latin. Oh, you got joint pain, super duper. We have millions of people with arthritis in the United States and in Florida countries, one in three adults. Nobody's ever looked to see if some of those arthritis cases may have been caused or exacerbated by fluoride. Just not looking. Are bones with more fluoride stronger or less strong? And the answer is less strong. And they got studies where they tried to give them a dose of fluoride, sodium fluoride, to cause an increase in bone mass. It did but it weakened the bone itself. So those are case-controlled studies. That's the gold standard in medicine. So we have case-controlled studies showing that if you give people fluoride, it accumulates in their bones and it causes the bones to become white, opaque, increases the bone density, decreases the bone tensile strength. And they actually took a bone that was removed from people for the purpose of replacing a, a joint or a hip, put it in a little device here where you put a weight on there and snap it, and they showed that the more fluoride in the bone, that quicker it snaps. Do you ever wonder, how come everybody has hip replacements, knee replacements? I mean, you can go on and on. I can think back when I was a kid, it, that didn't happen. You didn't see all these crippled people. I mean, you saw a few, but it wasn't common. I mean, how does it end up in our bones? Is, is that where our body just finds? Yeah. It's calcium-rich tissue, so your body parks it there because it's got to dispose of it some way, otherwise it would kill you. So it parks at the bone, and then it kills your bones. What it does once it fills up with fluoride, that you get little spikes on the outside of the bone. If you take a, a hand and, and take a bone and run, run your hand up and down a normal bone, it's slick. And that's because muscles move around on the bones when you're running or jogging or lifting weights and all that stuff. Your muscles are moving around on your bone and it's slick so it doesn't hurt. Well, if you make that bone the texture of sandpaper, then when the muscle moves around, the fascia tears and it hurts to move. And so fluoride accumulates in calcium rich tissues, which are Bone, ligaments, cartilage, joints, and teeth. So you have to look at this as you, if you have a lifetime body burden, and the, the less you're exposed to, the longer you can go before you develop symptoms. The first most irrefutable symptom of fluoride exposure is pain. And that's what we saw, my wife and I filmed a documentary in China. And Pain was the hugely significant symptom that they all had. They couldn't even work. And you know, in China, if you don't work, you starve to death. Have you ever heard of dental fluorosis? No. No. Okay. It uh, comes when somebody's overexposed to fluoride. It's awesome. That's a picture of very mild dental fluorosis. And so is that. You know, that young girl came to see me to get that fixed because she doesn't think that's beautiful. She thinks that looks bad when she smiles. And I think everybody else agrees with her. They say 41% of American teenagers have this condition. So this is the white spot. So it's been there. It's, it's a little scary, you know, knowing that many people, we don't even know, you know, what's in our water. 
Fluorosis can become more severe than a simple white spot. In severe cases, it can deform a patient's teeth. When you see spots on the teeth like this, that means you gave the child enough of a poison that the cells that were making that organ didn't make it right. They made it wrong. When I was a child, I was overexposed to fluoride. There are streaks of that in my teeth. So you learned that early on then? I knew, yes. Those teeth are very brittle, so I have cavities more frequently in those teeth than other ones that don't have the, the evidence of the fluorosis. Maybe you've seen it. It's white, chalky spots on your teeth. And I was told that those are calcium buildups. From the fluoride. Okay. There is a recent lawsuit in Maryland, it's a federal lawsuit, a woman who believed the medical establishment at the time when her daughter was an infant. She gave her daughter 90% of her diet intake of, of water was this fluoridated baby water. And so the daughter grew up with severe fluorosis and to get that corrected dental restoration is about $100,000 and they can't bear that burden. So they are suing Nestle and Gerber. So putting it in a baby bottle when the child doesn't have any visible teeth, there's no way on God's green earth that can have anything except a negative impact on that child. It will damage that baby's teeth. But they sell it in the grocery store as baby's first water. I've seen that for years. How do we educate women to not buy this for their babies? And this is why we wanted the warning for infants, because they're the most at risk. They drink their weight in water within two or three days. If you and I did that, we'd be drinking 22 liters a day. I mean, it just goes back to the whole of these regulatory agencies that are supposed to you know, be kind of looking out for our best interests. And as you know, they're not. There's no reason for the FDA to allow them to sell this as a food. It's a crime. I hope they're punished someday. I say they have a duty to warn. They have a duty to warn you. Not one manufacturer of formula says, by the way, don't use the tap water. Women, infant, and children, WIC program. We contacted them. They refused to tell mothers not to use the tap water. And you know what she said? It would damage the fluoridation program. Well, there's a study from 20 years ago showing infant mortality was higher in fluoridated communities. Is that why? I don't know. Why didn't they do a follow-up study? I think that would be interesting to know. Children have died, you know. There's been a case of a child who swallowed this, the dentist left the room, the parents didn't know, the kid swallowed it, had to be rushed to hospital, they couldn't save him, he died. So yeah, it's very toxic substance. There's no question about that. Is that the kind of stuff that a responsible parent would be putting in their child's hand? FDA in 1997 required manufacturers of toothpaste to put this warning label on it. It's the same as you'd have on a loaded 38 caliber pistol. Keep out of reach of children. And only use a little pea-sized amount, which is about the same amount that would be a, pin, a bottle of water. And if that amount is swallowed, call the poison control center or seek professional help immediately. So if I drink a bottle of water, should I call the poison control center too? This is just insane. So this is what two different organizations say. One says, don't swallow it. Why did they put that on there? They put that on there because there were 10,000 calls a year to the poison control centers from children made ill by swallowed toothpaste. 10,000 calls, and you know for every call, there's five that didn't call. And so, and there are only poison control centers in half the states. So that means 100,000 children are made ill by swallowed toothpaste. It's insane to put a deadly poison in a child's hand and say, go brush and be sure and spit out, Johnny. Florida has been a slow process of introduction into the dental profession where it's commonplace for us to consider Florida as the thing to do to help decay. But we now know, statistics have shown us, that Florida is not working. It's very toxic to you and can cause everything from cancer to depression. So, yeah, it's a serious issue. You are meant to have the right to informed consent to medication. What we're doing in a Floridated community is we're doing to everyone what a doctor can do to no one. A doctor says to you, he says, look, this glass of water is going to do wonderful things for you. It's going to cure your ingrowing toenails. It's going to make you less bald. It's going to do X, Y, and Z. Drink it. And you say, no, I don't want to drink it. You must drink it. You've got to drink it. I'm, I'm your doctor. I'm telling you, you've got to drink it. If he or she tried to do that to you, 
he or she could lose their license. You're not, you've got to tell the, the patient what the drug is good for, you've got to tell them what it's bad for, the side effects, and then they, in theory, make up their minds. This has been ripped away from us. Water fluoridation is the dispensing of a drug. This is not chlorine. This is not any number of the other uh, chemicals that are used to treat the water. Fluoride is being put in specifically to alter you physically, to make a physical change in you. Fluoride is a drug, is a medicine. This is the only thing anywhere in the world that gets added to the municipal drinking waters to actually treat the human. Well, anytime you see the letters F-L-U-O, you're talking fluoride. And so when you start realizing that Prozac is a, is a fluoride product, Zoloft is a fluoride product, virtually all of your psychotropic drugs, almost all of those that are mood elevators, and one of the reasons being is because it has this tremendous capacity to affect serotonin. Mm -hmm. Serotonin being the chemical that goes from one neuron to the other brain neuron. And so when we looked at the selective serotonin reuptake, and when basically an inhib inhibition of the serotonin to be taken up, that's the fluoride that's doing that. Prozac is fluoxetine. It's a fluorinated psychoactive. Matter of fact, all, almost all your psychoactive drugs are fluorinated drugs. They put it in there both as, as a carrier and an accelerator of the effect. The actual active ingredient in Prozac is fluoride. Prozac is made almost entirely from fluoride molecules. It is, and like SSRI drugs are similar molecularly to some of the elements in fluoride. Remember the school shootings in Columbine, Colorado? Yes. They were on SSRI drugs. Those drugs make your mind think that you're not living in the real world, that you're actually just sort of experiencing a, a false reality. And I think fluoride has much the same effect. There's tons of uh, products that are pharmaceutical products that, in some cases, the fluoride is just being used to what, the, what I call potentiate it, mm -hmm. uh, to actually make it a stronger one. Uh, fin, fin which was uh, the diet drug that yeah, uh, was taken that. off the, taken off the, well, wh why did they take it off? Well, fenfluramine, you can hear the fluoride part in there, the fenfluramine was the part that actually made the thickening of the heart valves so that they pulled off. The amazing part about it is, is rohypnol, the date rape drug. A lot of people mm, just yeah. call it that. The roofie. Okay, yeah, right. roofie. Yeah. yeah, and so what does that roofie do? Basically, it, it causes an anterograde amnesia. Well, okay, that's a fluoride product, so how does it do that? Well, we probably should have guessed that it would do that already anyway, mm -hmm. because if you went in and had uh, surgery, general surgery right now, knock on wood that you don't have to ever do that, but if you were, they would give you four molecules of fluorine and two of bromine and one of chlorine, and that's what knocks you out during that time. So the truth is, is that when you start looking at all the pharmaceutical uses for it, that it's, it's just amazing all the things that has been, that, that are around us all the time that we didn't recognize or that we didn't see. And so when you damage the IQ of the children, you lose your place in the country as a leader, and we have. And that's because of the damage that our government has allowed to happen to the intelligence of our children. If there wasn't research out there that's shown conclusively that it affects the brain and the neurons, that it affects the immune system, that it affects the bones, and it is incorporated into your body. Fluoride bonding is strong. You get something fluoride bonded, it's not easy to get it off. Well, what's going on? If you're going to give a child a dose of fluoride, show me the FDA approval where that's beneficial and even safe. It doesn't exist. The medical system that tries to say we need to ingest fluoride, that's really the only element they believe in. They won't recommend magnesium to reduce heart attacks. They won't recommend calcium. They won't recommend zinc for immune boosting function. They only believe in one element, and it's fluorine. You know, they, how come they don't look at the other elements that are needed? It's, 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 see, that's why it's very selective. It's a dogma. There is no you know, selenium waste product that they have to get rid of. That's why you don't hear about the benefits of selenium from industry. Right. But selenium is an anti-cancer element, and most people are deficient in it. You know, chromium, a trace element for blood sugar regulation. Most people are deficient in it. Why don't doctors and scientists say, let's put chromium in the water? Because they're not trying to get rid of it as a toxic waste. That's why. You know, if you look at the, the, the table of elements, you got to consider the whole thing. It's not scientific to say, well, let's just put this one element in the water. Well, what about all these others? Water fluoridation is a hoax. It's not scientific. It's not good medicine. It's not public health policy. It's a, a desperate attempt by certain industries to eliminate a toxic poison by feeding it to the people.
and calling it public health when it's clearly waste disposal. Paul Connett, Professor Emeritus of Chemistry from St. Lawrence University in Canton, New York, and now the Executive Director of the Fluoride Action Network. 14 years ago, my wife uh, put a bundle of papers down on my table and said, dear, would you read these? And I said, what is it? And she said, fluoride, fluoridation. I said, take that stuff away. These people are crazy. At that time, I felt that uh, fluoridation was all cut and dried. It was safe. It w worked well for teeth and so on. No problems. After I read the, the papers, the scientific papers, I was really rather humbled and embarrassed because I realized that this impression that I was walking around with, that there was, there was no issue here, there was no debate, was clearly not true. There were very serious questions. Uh, one of the issues that concerned me greatly was the, how low the level of fluoride is in mother's milk. It's actually as low as 0 0.004 parts per million, which means that a bottle-fed baby in a fluoridated community where the parents make up the formula with fluoridated tap water, it's gonna get 250 times more fluoride than a, a breastfed baby. And I felt then, and I feel now, that nature wouldn't have screwed up on something as fundamental as what a baby needed for, for healthy growth. And as I read more, I realized that there were some serious health concerns here. And as, as I read still more, it was clear that um, there was no difference in tooth decay between fluoridated and non-fluoridated countries. And also, even though most people have been persuaded that everybody is doing it, and you could argue that most people are doing this in the United States, but most people in the world are not doing it. Most countries are not fluoridated. 98% of Europe is not fluoridated. Uh, the majority of countries are not fluoridated. In fact, there's only eight countries in the world that have more than 50% of their water fluoridated. So the odd men out are the people that fluoridate. If you get chance to talk to an audience, uh, an audience with an open mind, an audience is prepared to listen, it doesn't take very long to persuade them that this is a very silly practice. It's bad, it's a bad medical practice. When you think about it, once you put it in the water, you can't control the dose. Once you put it in the water, you can't control who gets it, which means the very young, the very old, the very sick, the people with impaired kidney function, the people with poor diet. And also, there is no individual supervision. There's no doctor checking to see if there's any side effects. If you believe in fluoridation, that you believe that there's a single drug in the world that has no side effects. It would be absolutely remarkable if fluoride had no side effects. And the only way they're able to maintain this very unlikely position is that they're not doing comprehensive health studies in the United States to see if, if communities that are fluoridated are experiencing greater health problems. Are they experiencing arthritis? Uh, that's important because there is an increase in arthritis in the United States and we know that the first symptoms of fluoride's damage to the bone is just like arthritis, pains in the joints, uh, in the bones themselves. Another thing that's associated with fluoride is lowered thyroid function. Again, we have a huge epidemic of hypo underactive thyroid gland in the United States with symptoms like lethargy, uh, chronic fatigue, uh, depression, obesity, and so on. All of these things are all around us, but nobody is checking to see if there's any relationship between people drinking fluoridated water their whole lives. By the way, that's another reason why fluoridation is so preposterous. You are giving a drug to people for them to drink every day of their lives for the rest of their lives. Uh, I mean, it is, quite frankly, it's one layer of preposterousness on top of, a, of another. And to top it all, uh, to make it a, a very clear case of bad medicine, you're not giving people informed consent. You're allowing a whole community to do to everyone what an individual doctor can do to no one. An individual doctor cannot force a patient to take medicine. They are required to tell them the benefits and the downside, the side effects. And once the patient has heard these, then they are supposed to make up their own mind. We haven't given our consent to this. To me, it's the height of arrogance. We are meant to believe that just because they put on a white coat uh, to, and tell you that we're there, the experts, that we have to take this medicine. It's absolute nonsense. And, and, and the other thing which is preposterous about this is a dentist 
has skills on teeth. We go to dentists for them to drill and polish and do other things with our teeth. Those dentists are not trained. They're not specialists in the brain, in the bone, in the thyroid gland, in the lung, in the kidney, into hypersensitivity, into margin of safety analysis, into risk assessment, in toxicology. They don't have any of the skills which will enable them to go to the public and say it is safe. They haven't done the reading, they don't have the skills. It, it's, as I say, it's the height of arrogance. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention only has one division involved with the fluoridation issue, and this is the Oral Health Division, about 30 staff. If you look at their qualifications, they're nearly all dentally trained, and their function is to promote fluoridation. It's been the policy of the US Public Health Service to endorse fluoridation and promote fluoridation since 1950. And all they're doing is to promote it. And they do it very aggressively. They send their personnel to state legislatures and, and support mandatory fluoridation. So they're very aggressive and enthusiastic about this practice and they promote it. And therefore they have a huge conflict of interest when it comes to a question of whether this practice that they have promoted for 60 years, whether they have a conflict of interest when they tell you that the process is effective and safe. This is what is very peculiar because as the evidence of effectiveness gets weaker and weaker, as they admit now that the mechanism, they got the mechanism wrong for, for over 50 years, for over 50 years they thought that the baby had to swallow the fluoride and the fluoride would be incorporated in the growing enamel. So when the teeth erupted through the gums, they would be harder and more protected against acid attack. They now say, no, that doesn't work that way. It's, it works topically, it works from the outside of the tooth. So they, they've changed the mechanism. Well, as this evidence for uh, lack of benefit and the evidence of harm gets stronger, they seem to want to fluoridate more. They seem to, right now, they want to introduce mandatory fluoridation in Oregon, in Pennsylvania. Uh, they've talked about Massachusetts. They've just got it through Louisiana. They've just got it through Nebraska, mandatory fluoridation. In Australia, they've just got mandatory fluoridation through in Queensland. In Victoria, they're forcing it on communities without even giving them a chance to, to vote on it. And it's puzzling, puzzling why they continue to promote this so aggressively. But I think the real issue here is lack of a loss of credibility. I think the US Public Health, Health Service and all its minions, the NIH, the um, Department of Health and Human Services, the CDC and so on, have all promoted fluoridation so aggressively, so enthusiastically. Every Surgeon General has endorsed fluoridation since 1950. And I think now they feel that if they admit uh, that they were wrong, uh, that this is going to harm their other public health projects. My advice to them is the way to minimize liabilities is to, to stop fluoridation in the name of the, the precautionary principle. And that way you don't admit to anything. You're not saying we think that fluoride damages bones and that's why we're stopping because if you did it that way then the, the lawyers would be jumping up and down across the country and having lawsuits for everybody who's had a hip fracture, everybody's got arthritis, everybody's got lowered thyroid function. Um, so I think that's the way as you know, Bill Herzig, the EPA, said it very well. He says they're riding a tiger and they don't know how to get off. You know, they've told everybody for years that it's safe and effective and it's neither. But they don't know how to admit up to that. But as I say, I think a careful application of the precautionary principle would get them out of a tight corner. You've got two choices. Either they're aware, and they're, but they're frightened of telling the public and admitting this, or they're totally, utterly incompetent. They can't read. I mean, all you've got to do is to read the literature. The open literature, there's a lot on fluoride's damage to the bone. There's a huge amount of literature now on fluoride's damage to the brain. And incidentally, there is no argument about fluoride's ability to damage the body. It's a known highly toxic substance. Millions of people worldwide have had their bones wrecked and other tissues impacted by natural fluoride. We've known forever that it interferes with enzymes, interferes with other aspects of biology and, and biochemistry. 
And it's also very clear and well established in literally hundreds of articles from India and China and other parts of the world which have high natural levels that people's lives have been ruined by exposure to fluoride. Uh, skeletal fluorosis, uh, uh, damage to the brain, damage to the kidney and, and other things, well established. The only argument that's left is, is there an adequate margin of safety between the levels which cause this harm in the literature and the levels at which people are exposed in a fluoridated community? Now I would state quite clearly and, and categorically that there is no adequate margin of safety to protect everyone in society drinking fluoridated water. So it's a practice that should be ended as soon as possible. And it's not as if we don't know that it's harming people. There are 32% of American children, and this is a study conducted by the Center of Disease Control in 2005, admits that 32% of American children have dental fluorosis, which indicates that they've been overexposed to fluoride, not just in fluoridated water, but from all sources of fluoride, dental products, air pollution, some foodstuffs, and of course, fluoride in, in water, and also fluoride in the foods and beverages which have been prepared with fluoridated water. You add all that up. And our kids are being overexposed to fluoride. And their gamble, always they say that dental fluorosis is a cosmetic effect. Nonsense. It's the first indication that the body has been poisoned by fluoride. And the open question is what other tissues have been damaged? You know, as far as the thyroid function is considered, concerned, uh, doctors in Europe between the 1930s and the 1950s used to give patients sodium fluoride tablets to lower the, the activity of the thyroid gland. What's it going to do to somebody who uh, has normal thyroid function? Or someone who's got, already got low thyroid function or borderline thyroid function? Uh, I think it's reasonable to suggest that it could make things worse. And yet they're not looking at that. It's reprehensible, it's irresponsible, but it all goes to point to the fact that right now they're more interested in protecting this policy and their credibility than they are interested in protecting the health of the citizens of this country and the other citizens in other Floridated countries. I think the notion of using the public water supply to deliver medication is such so preposterous uh, and denying informed consent to everyone is, is, is uh, that's not difficult. I think everybody can realize quickly, ask any pharmacist, would you ever deliver medication where you couldn't control the dose? No. Would you ever deliver medication and give it to everybody, regardless of age, um, health, or what have you? No. Would you ever give a, a medication which hasn't been prescribed by a doctor? No. Would you ever give medication that doesn't have a doctor's supervision somewhere to check side effects? No. Would you give medication without the patient's informed consent? No, 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 no. So that, I think, is very straightforward. This is bad medicine. And it's bad ethics uh, and the AMA is very very clear about the necessity for getting informed consent when you're giving drugs to people. How many arguments do you need before you say no uh, this is not a good idea? We know we've never done it with anything else. We've never used the public water supply to deliver a vitamin, a vitamin, to deliver heart medicine or aspirin or many other things, statins. There are, there are many other things where maybe some doctors would want everybody to get a small dose of these drugs or vitamins, but they've never ever done it. It doesn't make sense to get to, to drink it, to put it inside your body if it works topically. If it works topically, then brush your, your teeth with toothpaste, fluoridated toothpaste, but don't drink it. Don't expose every tissue in the body. And for that matter, don't expose people that don't want it. It makes as much sense to put fluoride into people's drinking water as it would to swallow sun lotion. You would be laughed out of court if you suggested that. And in the same token, people that suggest putting this known toxic substance that works topically, if at all, into the drinking water, which is inviting systemic exposure to every tissue in the body, that also should be laughed out of court. As I said before, the emperor has no clothes. Our right to choose is being violated. No, no one's asking us if we want this stuff in our water, they're just dumping it in. And the last time, you know, I checked, when it comes to medicine, you cannot forcibly medicate me. <laughs> you know, that has to be something I decide. I have a responsibility as a resident in my city 
to say, you know what, you're infringing on our rights when it comes to our ability to choose. Communities of color, and it, whether it be black and Latino, um, are more likely to uh, live in areas where they are fluoridated. And uh, also because of all of the different uh, health problems that blacks and Latinos have already, you know, uh, regardless of the fluoride, it gets, you know, their health conditions get exasperated. We're hoping that what will take place is that some of the uh, social workers in the community and those who work with especially teen mothers will make sure that each mother learns and knows that when it comes to your drinking water, it's fluoridated. So that means that you shouldn't allow your child to um, drink this water. But the problem is these are low-income mothers and the question becomes where do they get their unfluoridated or fluoride-free source of water? And uh, it's a very good question because financially, you know, is it even possible for them? People who hear about this are totally surprised because they've been raised, again, they've been raised to believe that fluoride period is good for you. It's gonna turn out to be the next radium <laughs> uh, scandal or the next uh, tobacco scandal. And when, you know, once this hits the fan, you know, I think people are going to be totally demoralized. And, and I think that's the concern that the EPA, the CDC, and the ADA have, that all of these people who have been trusting them for so many years are just going to just give up with all the trust. When I was in dental school, of course, I was taught how wonderful it is. Oh, it's great, it's good. It prevents cavities. You know, community water fluoridation is the cheapest, most cost-effective way of preventing tooth decay. Um, and I just bought that because what do I know? I'm just a dental student. I expect my professors and teachers to know more than I do. And uh, so I just accepted it. And then I started looking at the chemistry of it and researching um, more about fluoride. And then it became clear that um, we've been manipulated. And then the, the book, if you're familiar with the, the Fluoride Deception by Christopher Bryson, um, that's when I became aware of the history behind the fluoridation of, of water in this country. What we've been told wasn't true. Uh, and then again, you start looking at the studies and, and thinking about it. Um, you know, the systemic effect of fluoride on your teeth, just, it just doesn't happen. So when I started, you know, again, putting all of it together and looking at it, um, it was really clear that we had been misinformed. And the problem with it over fluoride is that the dentists themselves have been so indoctrinated that um, so oftentimes they, they reply or retort with some sort of dogma. Frankly, I think most of the dentists have not educated themselves on this issue thoroughly enough. I think what you tend to see is everybody getting up and they're just parroting and saying what they've been told with very little thought or examination. And so it must be good because all these other people say it's good. Well, look at the science, look at the chemistry, see if it makes sense. Some people have called it a protected poison. And the reason for that, I believe, is that you know, manufacturing, quite frankly, needs it to, to produce and make a lot of things. Uh, the trouble is, is they come up with a toxic waste and they have to get rid of it. You know, how nice to be able to sell your garbage to communities and put it in the water. Why are all these brave and courageous people, you know, standing up to this Goliath and saying no more? It's because um, the, the truth is what it is. I think that the body of evidence claiming fluoride is bad is generally summarily dismissed by the bulk of the profession as just BS or, you know, um, bad information, bad source. Um, no point in looking at that. We already know the truth, you know, dogma, dogma, dogma. My belief is, is if the dentists themselves really started looking at the information independently, they might be a little unhappy with organized dentistry. At one time I thought that I could bring this, this problem up through the system, at least get my colleagues to look at it, you know, and I got shut down. You know, and so that told me that, you know, 
there are, supposedly there's a way you know you should it seems to me there should be a way for a, a member to bring up something that doesn't that's not working and the group of us should sit down and examine it but that just doesn't happen so I think the only way things are going to change is if pressure comes from outside the profession um, by citizens uh, and you know other organizations, other dentists who know the truth. It's really sad that we can't clean it up ourselves, but again, I think that's that's because um, if all of this were to change, it's going to influence the income stream for a lot of people. That puts a lot of pressure on um, on continuing to do things the way we do them. So. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of pressure there. The substance they want to put in, or typically put in, hydrofluorosilicic acid, um, has lead and arsenic in it too. Uh, so you're going to add more lead to the water that's there. And in addition, the chemistry of fluoride is such that it pulls lead out of the pipes. So here you have a situation where fluoride's pulling more lead out of the pipes, so it's releasing lead to the community. Well, in this community, I think I'm the only dentist that's anti-fluoride. I'm the only one who's willing to be vocal about it. There may be others that secretly believe that, but they're not willing to come out of the closet. So you take a position like I do, and it, it, it puts you at a lot of risk. And I don't think most dentists are willing to do that. I don't even want to be in that position. The, the, the problem is, is that I've been raised also to do the right thing, and a, a belief that um, that most people want to do the right thing. I find this appalling that uh, we're in the position we are. It's just uh, unbelievable. Matter of fact, my cousin gave me some anti-fluoride literature to me oh, a few years before I went to this conference, and he said, he said, listen, I don't know anything about this. I've got people that are telling me fluoride's not good, and you say it's good. Read this stuff. So he handed me the stuff I read, and I said, this is garbage. It's good. Fluoride's good. Um, I mean, I used to believe that too, until I got to look at the science. And you look at the science and it's indisputable. It's bad. And um, you know, it's maybe a minority position, but it's the truth. You know, fluoride is bad. It's not a topic that most dentists sit around and talk about anyway. It only comes up at you know, city council meeting type things. And I, I know, you know it was really hard the other night at the city council meeting because I gotta tell you, several of the dentists that got up there are acquaintances and old friends of mine. And I'm sure that they find it very discouraging f for uh, an old friend, former board member to get up there and, 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 uh, and shame them on what they're doing. Um, it's, I hate to be in that position. I mean, there are other people that have reversed their positions too because they have the wherewithal and the guts to examine the literature and, and say, you know, maybe we're wrong about this. Maybe this is true. And when you start to see the studies and, and you do the work, you go, whoa, this is wrong. Um, but then, you know, most dentists are just not doing that. They're, they're, it just isn't happening. You know, people people who do what I do, they're they're looking for the truth, you know, and, and, and it's about the truth. I mean, this is insane. This is craziness. It really is. You know, putting putting this chemical in the water, I mean, even if we could accept it worked, why do we have to put everybody else at risk? When you go and you look at the history about this, this information's been known for 60, 70 years. It's been repressed and, and people, good people, have lost their jobs and their careers just by doing the right thing. This fluoride controversy has been going on from the get-go. And people were voicing the same concerns 50 years ago that they're bringing up today. This isn't new. And the same, same old, same old, same old. It's just that um, the people who want to push this through have just gotten more clever at, at shoving things through on a legislative basis. And, um, continue to provide more disinformation. Have I ever debated anybody who was pro-fluoride? No. You know why? They refuse to show up. That's how, that's how they deal with it. They don't show up. They can't debate it. You're not ever going to get uh, anybody in the same room with David Kennedy to debate fluoride. I'll tell you that right now. He's a walking encyclopedia and uh, he knows his stuff. 
and won't be intimidated. But no, you know, they don't show up. Um, it, we've invited them time and time again to be on the radio or have a forum. No one, else, no one shows up. I got involved in fluoridation because as an instructor and a professor and a teaching master in the water treatment training business, I had a student come to me and say, you didn't have the right information. You should take a look at some of the new information. I was just flabbergasted and I wondered how many people in the water treatment industry knew how they had been hoodwinked. So when I started to speak to operators in the last seven years, I started to tell them about these hazards and the problems with their systems. And this was echoed in stories told back to me by the operators. And a lot of operators came to me clandestinely and said, you know, I also have observed health effects because I've been handling the concentrated form of these chemicals. I have problems with arthritis-like symptoms. I can't work in fluoride rooms because when I do, there's a sensitization and I have to be removed. And I felt that treatment plan operators as a whole weren't being represented. Um, nobody was listening to them. So I started to survey them and I found out that overwhelmingly, once they found out the truth about the hazards of the substance they were dealing with and the fact that it really doesn't do what it's supposed to do, that is dental decay prevention when ingested, many of them question whether or not we should be putting that substance in the water. In fact, emphatically, most of them said, let's get it out. Every time I speak at a public hearing, I'm not seen as some nut job. I'm seen as somebody who teaches their plant employees, the guy who their people get instruction from, and those are the same people in their communities that they rely on to provide safe drinking water. So there's a bit of credibility when I speak, but more importantly, there's awe when they find out the truth of what's going in the drinking water. Hydrofluosilicic acid, the chemical waste product from the f phosphate fertilizer industry. This is a substance that simply goes from a processing plant into a tanker truck and is delivered to a water treatment plant in my community. And my counselors at the time were astonished that this product could even exist. And when they asked their own municipal engineers whether this was so, those engineers confirmed the fact believing that the substance that's going in the water is somehow a pharmaceutical grade or some well-prepared um, purified extract is completely false. This stuff comes filled with heavy metals. I have one certificate of analysis that shows upwards of 34 parts per million of lead in the shipment that was delivered to a municipality, not mine, but just down the road. And lead is a prohibited substance in the province of Ontario from being added to drinking water. It doesn't matter that it gets diluted 180,000 times in the process. Who would stand at the top of a water tower and deliberately add lead and known human carcinogen to the drinking water? And if I had done that, even as a certified operator, I would have been arrested immediately. There is no difference except the argument of dilution. I had spent Oh, let's see, 25 years teaching students at the point I was enlightened. And my training was that fluoride was a compound simply added to the water for tooth decay prevention. This was the common thought. The problem with that is all of the books that were used to educate operators on drinking water treatment processes all said the same thing. And it was as if they came from some sort of scripted source. In 1995, I wondered that perhaps we should have more fluoridation throughout the province. And I began a uh, exploration of the possibility of providing courses to teach operators how to fluoridate the water. Now it seems incongruous, but at the time it was something that I was exploring. And I, I was one of the few CDC trained water engineers who have been able to provide um, CDC related training to operators about how to fluoridate drinking water supplies. So I wasn't speaking from a, uh, from a, uh, a point of wilderness 
I was speaking from a point of authority with the CDC information fully indoctrinated into my being going out talking to my students, which were the treatment plant operators. People tended to trust the expert. And the problem with trusting the expert is that if the expert makes a mistake, those people end up having a mistaken belief. And that's exactly what happened. I used my CDC training to advocate for fluoridation only to find out from one of my students that I was all washed up. And more importantly, that student was graceful enough to tell me that I was full of crap. And better than that, I realized that perhaps I didn't have everything that I should have had in my armory of information to teach that I had to go back and learn more. And when I did, I found out I was wrong. And there's nothing wrong with being wrong. The wrong, the greater wrong, is not correcting it. And that's what I'm doing now, and that's why I speak out about this. Like everything else, when you find out a truth that's unsettling, I was deeply embarrassed about the crime I had committed, an educational crime I had committed for the previous 20 or so thousand students who had heard the fluoridation was fine. And there's, an, there's a deep-seated feeling to undo that piece of information in the minds of those individuals. If I could go back in time and pull that, extract that chunk of information from their mind and replace it with what I know now, I would feel much better. Fluoridation tends to be a belief system. And in order to have a belief system, you have to have a creed and you have to have faith. And the creed has been established by the simple words of safe and effective. The faith is established by trust us, we're the professionals, we're the doctors, we're the health professionals, we know better. The reality is once you start to pick away at the basis for the creed, suddenly the faith is eroded. And I suppose my job is to change the creed to the point where the faith is eroded enough that people will abandon the faith and it'll be one of those faith systems that dissolves away into history. My argument with fluoridation in dentists is this. First of all, no dental authority that I've ever met is qualified to speak about water quality. And when we're talking about putting hydrofluosilicic acid as an ingested fluoride product into our bodies through the stomach with a faint hope that it's going to do something through the saliva on the surface of the teeth without affecting any other parts of the body, um, this is just wishful thinking. So I have said publicly that if you show me a dentist who's qualified beyond what lies in the human body between the chin and the nose, I'll be glad to listen to them about water quality. But until that point in time, I'm not going to take my direction from dental authorities or dental trade associations or the dental unions about water fluoridation. When they step into the realm of water quality, they're in my world and they're not qualified to talk about it. 99.5% of all of the fluoride that gets put in with the purported use of treating teeth passes right through into the wastewater stream and back out into the receiving environment. The main component of hydrofluosilicic acid is water, 75%. The other component, the 25%, is the actual hydrofluosilicic acid uh, active ingredient. However, there are small percentages also of hydrogen fluoride and heavy metals, and the heavy metals include primarily lead, arsenic, cadmium, mercury, and the more alarming thing for me are amounts of radionuclides, which are radioactive components that are scrubbed out of the stack gases. The entire treatment process is done before hydrofluosilicic acid gets added, and then we deliberately degrade it with this stuff. And when we degrade the water quality, we are not delivering the best water quality that we are capable of. We're delivering it at some standard that's less. 
And I believe that my neighbors, my family, my friends, all deserve the best water quality that the technology, of the technology that we can afford. And hydrofluorosilicic acid just goes the wrong way. The problem with this stuff is that we can't dispose of it on the land, we can't dispose of it readily into a receiving stream. So the only other alternative is to find a alternative use for it as a product or um, treat the waste on site to neutralize its effect. Well, the treatment of the waste is expensive. It's uh, far more profitable to take it out and truck it around the country and uh, discharge it through the water treatment plants into the water systems, through people's guts, and ultimately back to the water systems because all of the wastewater that, in, that is in the community gets washed down the pipes through the sewage plants and then out into the receiving streams and lakes. If I had the same tanker truck that rolled across the border into Canada from a fluoride phosphate plant in Florida, discharge into the Niagara River its entire load, there would be an, there would be an environmental disaster, there would be a hue and cry for the, the driver, the discharger, the owner, the, the owner of the product, the producer, etc. But to do it inside a treatment plant is perfectly legal. So we're creating a situation where we're, we're just going to poison everybody slowly. I'm John Martinelli, president of uh, S. Martinelli & Company. When I basically went public with my opposition to the Watsonville's plans to fluoridate the, the municipal water supply, we received quite a bit of feedback from our consumers. I would say about 90% of the people that we heard from were uh, supportive of our position in opposition to fluoride. And, but we're also saying, you know, if you have fluoridated water in your product, we're not gonna be able to buy it anymore. And they're very, very concerned for all of the health, health reasons um, that, uh, you know, that we should not have fluoride in our product. And so it's been, it's been very difficult to overcome the perception that the consumer has that if Watsonville fluoridates, that Martinelli's apple juice is gonna have fluoride in it. And that is absolutely not the case. We don't have any water in our apple juice products. However, we have a, a whole line of products that we've introduced just in this last year that have water as a primary ingredient. Those products really represent a lot of our growth opportunity. And one of the things that I tried, didn't have a chance last night to, to make the point with the city council because they cut me off and didn't give me enough time to talk. But one of the points that I wanted to make was a lot of our growth opportunity is with these uh, sparkling lemonades. And you know we're trying very hard to grow our business in this community and employ local people you know we want to grow our business and we want to grow it in watsonville but i can't do it by putting fluoridated water in our new product lines we're absolutely not going to use fluoridated water in any of our products or our process and so uh we're going to we're going to dig a well and uh, there's an aquifer that's 600 feet down called the Aromas Red Sands Aquifer. And it is pure as the driven snow. And it's been tested, but it, it happens to be the same aquifer that the city of Watsonville has tapped into for our municipal water supply. We're gonna have our own well, and we are going to uh, put that water in our lemonade products and use it in our process. Um, and it will have zero fluoride in it. So it's going to be expensive and time consuming and, and something that I wouldn't otherwise have to do if, uh, you know, if they, if they weren't going ahead with this fluoridation effort. You know, just as a concerned member of the community, I mean, I've had people come up to me after those meetings saying, you know, John, even if you get your own well and you solve your own problem, please don't abandon us because, you know, we need your support and we need help uh, making sure that this doesn't happen just for the people. And I really believe that that unfortunately I've been thrust into a role where I've become a spokesman for this. Uh, it's not something that I relish. It's not something that I want to do. It's not attention that I want to bring to our company uh, because some people really react negatively but unfortunately because I do have the, the, the opportunity to stand up and speak about it um, I find that I'm kind of obligated and compelled to do it because I believe that fluoridating the municipal water supply is just the wrong thing to do.
January 2010, we received notice, and I'm going to say it was less than a week, that the council had a contract and they were ready to, uh, to sign it at the next council meeting. And we were all stunned because literally years and years had gone by with apparently no action, no activity, and had no idea that Mayor Alejo was pushing this agenda of his uh, along. And so we had to scramble. It's my understanding that the state law, the state mandate that requires that communities fluoridate if they have 10,000 uh, water hookups and funding is offered by another source other than the, the, the local community, that that law trumps our local ordinance, which was Measure S, was voted on and passed. The will of the people was to not have fluoridated water and that should be honored. So we are just shocked and appalled that our state government believes that they know more than we do and that they can impose their will uh, and, and force fluoridation on a community that doesn't want it. My grandfather was the first one in this community to oppose fluoridation back in the 50s. And that's why, you know, during the meeting last night, they kept talking about, oh, we've been doing this for 10 years. Heck no, it's been over 50 years. And my grandfather funded the first campaign and there was a vote of the people and the will of the people was to not fluoridate. That happened back then. Then there was another one um, with Measure S. My dad was a major uh, funder, uh, you know, uh, majorly funded that campaign. And, uh, and, and, and wrote a lot of the, the documentation, the ads that we ran in the papers and whatnot. Uh, and we were successful again at, uh, in fact, that was the third time that, this, that, this, that the uh, community had voted against fluoridation over that 50 year period. Personally, I've been aware of it as long as I've, I've been on earth because my family's been fighting fluoridation, uh, mostly for moral reasons, not so much as they relate to our business. That's come along more recently because of our new lemonade products where water is an ingredient. Um, we have been fighting fluoridation because we believe it's mass medication and it's immoral for the government to, to, to do that. I've been raised with that. Um, I believe it. I've also done my own research and have come to the same conclusions that my father and my grandfather have uh, in, uh, in their opposition to fluoride. And I agree with them. I, th I think that there's even more evidence now than we had back then to suggest that it's, it's really not worth the risk. I really believe that it's the wrong thing to do and that our government is, is overstepping its bounds by forcing this product, this medication on the, the, the community. So many of these public health uh, professionals are obligated to carry that torch and it's part of their sort of mandate that we're going to support fluoridation, the public policy of fluoridation, and no matter what. And so even though individually, I don't believe they all really think that fluoridation works or that it necessarily doesn't uh, have harmful effects, but they carry that torch because they have to. And uh, it's really unfortunate that, um, you know, they use their, their, their position as, uh, as health professionals, even though they don't have personal knowledge necessarily about the ills of fluoridation. When it comes to water fluoridation, uh, I was completely blindsided. When two citizens and one counselor came to me in my hometown and asked me to help remove fluoridation from our municipal drinking water, I had no opinion, I had no bias, but I did remember thinking to myself, how tough could this be? I worked on some very difficult social activist issues in the past. I was burnt out. I wasn't looking for any other issues. And I made the mistake of believing water fluoridation would be an easy issue to deal with if we simply talked about the science. What I've come to learn is that of all of the issues I've ever volunteered to work on and committed my time to, water fluoridation is the most difficult, bizarre, Orwellian issue I have ever had to deal with. The pushback to suppress the truth is like nothing I have ever experienced before. 
One would think when investigating water fluoridation, we would only need to look at science. After all, we're not trying to affix blame. We're not trying to um, gain something from pointing up a mistake in the past. We're simply trying to make a good decision going forward. If we're talking about a scientific issue and health, and maybe even health benefit, why on earth would we not want to address science square on? Unless, of course, people are afraid the science is going to be too damning and too crushing to policy already in place. Why are we putting the cheapest industrial toxic waste into our drinking water if we really care about the health and well-being of our children and our children's oral health? Um, is it reasonable to have lead contaminants in hydrofluorosilicic acid? Uh, why would we want to trade off our children's brains for healthy teeth? I mean, let's look at the real issues here. Let's look at the trade-offs that are before us and decide what makes sense. And to me, I think when people see the trade-offs and fully realize what's being used to fluoridate their water, it'll become obvious. We have uh, dental lobby groups uh, that have been bombarding us to say, trust us, we know what we're doing. Um, well, in our community, they've had 66 years to prove to us they know what they're doing and they haven't offered up much science and they haven't provided it when asked. The dentists clearly are not qualified to comment on systemic ingestion of anything. I think we're going to have to go to the experts on systemic ingestion, on toxicology, on the combinatory effects of various chemicals in water, and those experts will have the relevant facts and the relevant truth about those concerns which we're being asked to trade off against possible reduction of dental caries which has yet to be demonstrated causally uh, or conclusively at this period in time, six decades into water fluoridation. What we observe when we present proponents of fluoridation with science that calls into question the efficacy or even the safety of fluoridation is almost an immediate and overt denial that that science has any quality, even without picking it up and reading it. Running from science has nothing to do with finding truth. Um, one, wants to want, one has to wonder uh, why run from something if your science is so solid? Why turn a blind eye uh, when sometimes your science doesn't bear out what you thought it should? Uh, it's always interesting to observe when promoters of fluoridation say, uh, we introduced fluoride into the drinking water and dental caries rates went down and it's because of the fluoride. And then you say, well, what about where fluoride was introduced into the drinking water and dental caries rates didn't go down. In fact, maybe they even went up. Well, there's something wrong with that study because fluoride was in the water. That's not a sound or fair way of assessing science when you throw out data that doesn't bear out the results you're hoping for. It's helpful when considering water fluoridation to also consider the precautionary principle. That principle being, if in doubt, don't do it. If in doubt, leave it out. For those who say we should continue to fluoridate our water on the chance that it might be reducing dental caries, in my mind, the precautionary principle would say consuming the coal contaminants, arsenic, lead, mercury, radionuclides offers a perfect opportunity to consider the precautionary principle. Perhaps we should stop consuming those things bundled with hydrofluorosilicic acid and its silico fluorides until such times as we have overwhelming evidence that there's any benefit. When one reviews the history of water fluoridation, it's quite interesting how the architects of the marketing of water fluoridation conducted themselves. Instead of putting science out front to sell water fluoridation to the public and convince the public that it's warranted, in fact what happened was a belief system was constructed. Edward L. Bernays, who was hired to market water fluoridation by the polluting industries, was very clear in his statement when he said, we know we cannot talk about the science behind water fluoridation. So what we must do is we must find white coats 
to promote water fluoridation. And once we have those white coats promoting water fluoridation, whenever anyone wants to talk about the science, we'll simply point to those white coats and say, well, if it isn't good for you, why would they say it is? That's not a discussion about science. That becomes marketing. And it's a very smart thing to do because we all know that it's much more difficult to deconstruct a well-placed, well-lived belief system that's entrenched for many decades. However, it's much easier to have a rational debate where science trumps science until we get to the truth. Yes, there's good science and there's bad science, but we're quite capable today to evaluate science on its quality and its merits. And we need only do that to deconstruct water fluoridation. The problem is the belief system has been entrenched in the public's mind for more than 60 years. So when one wants to add fact into a belief system that does not dovetail neatly and comfortably into that belief system, the human response is to reject the fact rather than realign the belief system. Uh, in psychological terms, that's called cognitive dissonance. We simply can't package something that doesn't sit well for us, makes us feel too uncomfortable, and may keep us up at night. Because after all, it would be very nice to go to bed thinking and believing. There are others out there, the dental associations, public health, Health Canada, who are looking after our well-being while I'm sleeping tonight. But to believe that perhaps they've made a gross error and are now not willingly going to admit that doesn't sit well. So it was very, very smart to work with belief systems and construct belief systems because they're very difficult to deconstruct, as I've said. And what we have to do is be willing to set aside biases and sit down at a table as friends and neighbors and discuss the science. Some people who say the science is too difficult to understand, then let's bring in people from both sides of the issue, proponents and opponents of water fluoridation, who are qualified to comment on the science, on the chemistry, on the systemic ingestion, on the biology, on the physiology, on the statistics, on the methodology. They can help us understand what is good science, and what is bad science. And from there, we can make the decision based on the science in front of us, whether it's worth the risk. To me, that's the fairest resolve to deconstructing what I believe to be a myth that has been carefully constructed over six and a half decades. People sometimes will also ask, why would somebody purposely want to harm us? I don't necessarily think anybody purposely wants to harm us, but I do think if somebody's whole reputation as an industry and as an institution, for example, dentistry and dental associations, is built and predicated upon endorsements, first and foremost, look, mom, I have no cavities, fluoride. If that were found out to have been an oversight or a mistake, it would absolutely shatter the institution's credibility going forward for any future endorsements. That's got to be very frightful for an industry, and I understand that. But an industry's reputation cannot be set in front of public's health and well-being. Public health, unfortunately, falls into the same dilemma. If public health is found to be misguided all these decades simply because they relied on the opinions and the endorsements and the name dropping which permeates the fluoridation story and seems to be used to trump hard science, if they simply have depended on others and people find out that public health isn't actually firsthand vigilant, doesn't actually do research themselves, and in fact doesn't even have and understand much research when we ask them for it. Those institutions fall, people panic. Those institutions fall, people question when, if ever, do we trust those institutions again. 
So there's a lot of cognitive dissonance revolving around the fluoridation issue. And I don't think people know quite what to do. I think they would like to come clean. I think they would like to uh, have a reprieve, have a, um, a meeting of the minds where we can simply say, all right, let's try it and see what happens. Let's turn it off and let's look very closely. After all, if it is, as you say, one of the 10 most successful disease treatments of the 20th century, then it does warrant a few dollars of conscientious research. We've turned it on. We did what you said. You said you were doing research. You haven't. Nothing of import, nothing of conclusivity that it has merit. Let's turn it off. Let's spend a few dollars. Let's do some significant research and see if dental caries rates do rocket, do go off the scales, do rise to new heights. If they do, the dentists were right. If they don't, there's no reason we should be continuing with this practice any longer, especially with the health harms that we're starting to see associated with it. When it comes to the future of water fluoridation, I'm quite sure that water fluoridation practice will certainly meet its end, and a well-deserved end. That's not to say it may come soon. It might. But I am sure it will come eventually. If scientists were allowed to do unfettered research, publish for peer, re peer review, and would not suffer rebuke if their science happens to generate something less than positive in regards to water fluoridation the public would be better served. As it stands right now, most scientists who are not finding positive result to water fluoridation are ostracized and outed and segregated from their scientific community. Oppression should have nothing to do with good scientific research. If someone's research happens to show something that the pro-fluoridationists don't find favorable, it should be looked at. It should not be ignored. It should not be refused publication. The scientists should not be outed or refused tenure. It should be looked at as pure science. P people who are, are wanting to discuss water fluoridation are often met with um, elected officials running in the other direction, and, and they're often perplexed by that. But if you think about it for a moment, by and large, because water fluoridation is born on a belief system rather than science, you have on average about half the population that swings one way and the other half swings another way when it comes to whether we should or shouldn't fluoridate. Elected officials are very aware of that. If they are to take a stand on water fluoridation, it means they are to effectively divide their potential electorate in half. Elected officials aren't scientists. Uh, many of us have been looking at this for years. We have a 20-minute meeting with them, and we expect them to get their head around it in 20 minutes. They can't. It's overwhelming. From what I see at this juncture in my four and a half years of fighting fluoridation, the science is increasingly more solid about the health harms. However, it's being totally denied by the promoters of water fluoridation. Unfortunately for myself and my family, I'm a full-time activist on the water fluoridation issue. I don't know how long uh, I'll be able to sustain that, but I'll do it for as long as I can or until the issue resolves itself. I would love for this battle to end. I would love to be able to pack up and go home, to go back to my family, to go back to my business, to go back to earning an income. I really hope that day comes soon, but if it does not, I have to persist because it is the right thing to do. I believe this is wrong. I believe it's harming people. I believe people aren't being told the truth. I believe the science is being suppressed. If I were to do nothing 
to try to change that. I'm no better than the people who are perpetrating that. I've known about fluoride for years and years, but um, since it was never in my water, I didn't do much about it or think about it much, but they've put it in my water now. Now I'm activated to do something to get it out, this fluoride. It's poison. The newspaper will not publish one word about it where I am. So I've concluded the only thing I can do is one-on-one. -on -one. So for instance, I always carry a couple of copies of the newly released DVD called Professional Perspectives on Fluoride. I carry a couple of those around in my purse. So I'll be in a restaurant and I'll be, you know, the, the server's coming and she'll say, do you want water? And I'll say, well, is it fluoridated? And she, usually they have no idea, you know, what, huh, you know. So then I tell them, D don't you know anything about fluoride in the water? That it's really bad for you? Well, um, I, I thought it was good for the teeth. They'll go like that, see. So eventually I get around to telling, to asking them if they would mind if I made them a present of this DVD I happen to have here. And they'll usually, they'll take it, you know, and, in good humor. So um, that's one way I do it. Another, I'll meet friends. And one friend I met, you're not always welcome this way. She says, oh, you're on a crusade. And so what could I do? She walked away. So I wrote to her and I said, yes, I'm on a crusade. That's how important this is. The other way is I just decided I would go to the top. I've written to the president. I've written to the governors, uh, different governors. I've written to my own governor. I've written to vice presidents and, and the executive editors. I try to go to the top thinking that um, it's no use going to anybody lower down. They're only obeying orders. Now it looks to me like even those at the top are only obeying orders because they never reply, or when they do, they always say the same thing. Well, it's been proven over time that it's very good for children's teeth. It's safe and effective, safe and effective. Same form. So you never get a decent supply, a reply from any executive ever. The most important thing I can do is spend my time. I write letters, 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 letters. That's about the only thing I can do. I'm not a scientist. I can't do any research. I can talk about research, but there's even a limit to that because since I'm not a scientist, I may misquote, you know, that sort of thing. You get to be a pest. And uh, it, it can get to you if you take it personally, but um, I don't care. What I'm trying to do is more important than whether they think I'm a pest. So if I think I'm, I've gone that far with them, well, I just leave them alone for a while, you know? But uh, it's important to follow up to see if they actually watched the DVD. Because sometimes they say they have, and if you kind of question them a little bit, you find out they haven't. When you first approach a person about fluoride and they don't know anything about it, what they usually say is, well, it's good for the teeth. They think it's good for the teeth. So then you have to counteract that. <clears throat> and that's when I offer to give them the DVD where I'll say, you'll find out uh, here that there are all these famous, well-respected scientists around the world who explain why they think it's a bad idea to put it in the water. And that's the way I approach that. I, I n almost never find anybody who says, oh yeah, I know it's really bad. Never, never, not where I live. So it's always an uphill thing. However, I gave it to my dentist and he listened to it. And what did he do? He called my water department and they hooked him up with one of the engineers. And what did the engineer say? He said, this stuff is poison. Nobody should ever drink it. 
When he gave the, me that message, I was real happy. Then I, just by chance, got a brochure from another local dentist, a very nice brochure, uh, explaining his program and how he considered his attitude toward his work as very forward-looking. And I don't know why I decided to do it, but I said, oh, well, he gave his email. I'll email him. And I said, you say you're a forward-looking dentist. I said, what's your attitude about fluoride? Well, he wrote back. Now, most dentists will not touch you. They won't answer or anything. The essence was I offered to send him a DVD. And with the DVD, I would always send a little extra stuff, you know. And when I sent that, he again wrote back and gave me a marvelous quote from Tolstoy, which explained that when a person has a belief like that, like the dentists do, even though there's lots of evidence that it's not correct, it's in their, the, he calls it, they weave it into the fabric of their lives and they can't let go of it because they've been teaching it all their lives. They've been telling, talking about it to their friends all their lives. And he's talking about educated people like Dennis who believe that. And it's part of the fabric of their lives and they won't give it up. Now he sent that back to me, which was really, really unusual but he's obviously an unusual guy so those are two dentists who got educated were not afraid to read the material and get educated the thing that bothers me the most about fluoride is that they don't ask my permission you can't go out in your neighborhood and have coffee without knowing that that coffee has got fluoridated water in it so your whole life is is upset you you can't do that you can't grow an organic garden in your backyard anymore because you're sprinkling it with the hose and that's fluoridated water you can't filter it out unless you are well to do enough to buy reverse osmosis equipment or distillation because the carbon filters do not uh, this stuff is so soluble that it, it just goes right through anything. Carbon filters uh, don't touch it. So if you can't afford reverse osmosis, then you can't have all your water fluoridated. You could buy a small one that'll do your kitchen, you know. Uh, but then why should I pay the water department? I pay my bills and they deliver the water, but I can't use it. I have to spend extra. It, it's very hard to get the dentist to change the way they think. There are, once in a while, ones who do, and then that's, that's what keeps you going. My name is Bill Patnod. I live in uh, Methuen, Massachusetts, and I've lived there most of my life except for service. The first time they wanted to fluoridate, Dr. Zanfagner, an allergist, wrote this book, Truth Decay. And he was the leader from that time on. And this guy was ostracized. He was put down, belittled by his professionals and other people. I went to the reference library and I asked her for information on fluoride, pro and con. I knew the pro, but I wasn't sure about the con. And I found out that after an hour, that this was ridiculous. From the information that this, uh, the librarian, the research librarian gave me, I said, this can't be. I found it so quick and it's so ridiculous. So anyways, I searched some more and I got a name of Dr. Phyllis Mullenix. So what happened is I just took my map out and I went directly to her house with the paper. They went to Florida Aint Methuen Mass and I knocked on the door and said, geez doc, I'm here about this. She said, come on in. She's from Missouri and what a nice lady. My head spun with all the information she had. And we brought other people to meet her from Methuen and then hence the fight began with the remainder of Dr. Zanfagna's group and new people who, uh, who were fighting against it. And we beat it in 96 by 497, because it was beginning in 96, by 400 votes. 
And then again, 2002, they brought it up. We beat it by 2,000 votes. People just, you know, came up and they just listened. I mean, sure, there was those diehards, fluorides, wonderful, this and that. But, you know, to beat them by 2,000 votes when they were pushing it in their dental office, even the hospital that was in Methuen was pushing it and had signs out for it. And we still beat it because the people listened. And that was the best thing. It, it's, it's like a mission. It's like a, when you find out how bad it is, you just can't turn away. Every time I see a mother pushing a baby carrier, I say, how can I let that kid down? I can't. And, and we just can't do it. I, we were talking one day, and it was sort of made a joke of it. What if social scientists said, hey, let's save all the marriages in the world and put aspirin and Viagra in the water? I mean, it's ridiculous. Question authority. You can read, you can write, you can process information. You went through the school systems. Don't let anybody tell you they're the authority and they know best. Well, I tell everybody every day. I hate to say it, but I nearly got in a fight in a, a few fights in a bar talking about fluoride. I guess I talked to him. One guy had one too many. But let me tell you, I mean, it's sort of risky. It's sort of risky, you know? You, you got to go up there and say you got to be strong and you got to be you got to listen to the person on the other side you're trying to convince too. I put up a sign, it's a professional sign, two of them. I held one coming and going during commuting. We held one and had one posted in the center of the town. Fluoride's toxic. $2,000 to a charity if you prove otherwise. My name, my number, the a website. And guess what? Not one dentist, one lawyer, one doctor, one pediatrician. Nobody called except my state senator, my state senator and said, Bill, I tried to collect it, I couldn't. I said, Steve, of course not. I think I'm giving away $2,000. I just want to get people's attention. Could have been a million dollars. It wouldn't have made a difference. It's toxic. Oh boy, what keeps me going? That's, that is, it's just from the heart. It's how the spirit moves me. How, how, how we, we care about people. How, how I feel about myself. Uh, I have to look in the mirror and face myself and say, am I doing the right thing? Am I being ethical and moral? Am I helping my community out? Am, am I the type of person I really want to be? So each day I go out, hand things to people, talk to people, and, and let them know. Oh yeah, sometimes you get down and you get up, upset, but gee, you know, if you give up, you're done. So it's, there's no profit in giving up. I was telling people about it and they said, Bill, you're really getting into this thing, you know? So I, I try to tell jokes and keep it light and mention it. And they now my friends even joke back at me about fluoride. And they believe, but it took a while. I mean, they're good and open people, but it takes a while because of the 50 years that it was pushed. And of course the authority, the dentist with the white jackets, of course they know better than, than we do. But we know that doctors make mistakes and we really believe they've been lied to and uh, the propaganda is, is, is it, it's pressure on them to produce the, what the ADA wants them to say. And, uh, you know, I, I feel bad for them, but at the same time, we have to take them on and, and head on and, and tell them how we really feel. I feel a responsibility to the people of Methuen and the surrounding areas to let them know uh, what I know about fluoride. I got to know a lot of people that way. In fact, just walking in a restaurant uh, the other day, I didn't know who the guy was, and he says, I know you, you're the guy against fluoride. And I said, yeah, and in fact, I'm going to a conference next weekend to learn more about it. And he was sort of shocked, even my mechanic, when I dropped my car off before I came here, I said, yeah, Bob, you gotta get this ready and you know fix everything you can because I'm going up to upstate New York on a fluoride conference. He said, you are? I says, yeah, you still fight? Absolutely. So when people hear that, I think he even gave me a break on my bill. <laughs> when people hear that, that you're still out there fighting, they tell other people. And, uh, you know, and they, they believe you. It, it's, it's more valid that you're continuing the fight. We have a one dentist in, in Methuen. I, I, I know this from talking to mothers passing out flyers that he recommends not giving their, their kids fluoride. And that was so good to hear, but he will not come out against it, like, publicly. Well, from what we hear at these meetings and from, from dentists is that the ADA is uh, really monitoring dentists who, uh, who fight against this. And they put a lot of pressure on them to change their mind. You know, 
to save face. Uh, you know, I, I can't say why, why a professional organization who's supposed to have our health in the uh, best interest wouldn't look into this when even dentists in their own ranks are telling people not to fluoridate. Why wouldn't they take a step back and say, well, let's look at this. Why would they have such a hard, hard line on this, rigid line that they don't want to hear anything they know better, when even people in their profession are backing away from it? It's, I don't know if money's involved, power is involved, control's involved, saving face is involved, but whatever the reason is, it is wrong. A lot more fighting. A lot more fighting. A lot more money being spent. Uh, a lot more confrontations. But I think we are going to win. But the only way we can win is if the people listening to this will take the time to look at the issue, look at the, the freedom of choice, look at the science, and decide. They have to take control of their life, their children's lives, and do the right thing for them, for their own health and their family's health. Don't just kowtow to professionals and authority. Check it out. Like I said before, you learned how to read and write, you learned how to process information. Trust yourself. Trust yourself and challenge these people. Like I told one of my councilmen, I said, you know, you're giving your kids these fluoride pills. These are toxic. Ask your pediatrician. A month or so later, came back, Bill, I asked my pediatrician about the toxicity of these pills I'm giving my kid. And she said, well, I'll give it to you, give it to your kid every other day, not every day. I mean, what, what is going on here? So he said, that's it. My kid's not taking any of that. I mean, it's incredible. It just is. You just gotta, he just asked the question. And that was his answer. And right away he said, Psh, that's it. So it, it's, you have victories, you have victories. You gotta fight for them, but you have victories. And you, you can wake up every morning, look in the mirror and say, hey, well, before you go to bed, you look in the mirror and say, hey, I did something good today. And you just feel good within yourself and your heart. Well, if you just read the warning label on your toothpaste, boy, that, 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 that's a persuader. Once you read it, it just, should just, just make you angry about not knowing about how bad fluoride is. If you swallow more than a recommended amount, which is pea size, you have to call poison control. Where's informed consent on this? Where's informed consent when your child is sitting down getting a fluoride treatment? If they swallow it, they can get sick or die. They don't tell people about this. You know, dentists are professionals and they go to school and they're trained. You only know what you're taught and what you're trained and what you're given and within the curriculum that, that you're taking. So if the propaganda is there about fluoride, well, they're going to, you know, definitely push it. Well, yeah, they say put it in the water because people aren't responsible enough to brush their teeth or, uh, you know, the, the poor people don't have, like, good, maybe good oral health uh, uh, habits. You know, the thing is that they can treat those people with about the same amount of money that we would put in into the water fluoridation of your city or town. They could send the dentist. They, they could uh, have dentists go to schools and work on these kids. You know, there are other options to that. Of course, people need to know how to brush their teeth, floss their teeth, and they have to eat correctly, you know, good nutrition. And that should be checked at school with the, with the, the nurse to help those individuals out and those families out. You can give them toothpaste. There's a lot of things you can do then, flirting the water and having the whole, the whole community ingest this stuff. Yeah, I, I have spent, I stopped counting because my wife gets too angry at me. I don't tell her anymore. I spent over 30,000 fighting this so far. And that includes copies, ads on TV, the radio, sending stuff out, traveling, doing a lot of different things. But let me tell you, I wouldn't change it. I'd spend 60,000 if, if I could. It, it's, it's a fight that needs to be fought and people have to stand up and, and fight against it. Like I was in the service in Nam and my friends passed away. And I'm gonna let them down? No way. Well, of course you get angry. And uh, there was one time I, I had to go to Florida City Council. Uh, it was a big meeting. A lot of firemen were there and everything, but I got on the, about closing out fire stations. But the thing is, I was there and I said, look, this pediatrician who spoke about fluoride, he didn't tell the truth. As far as I'm concerned, that DR in front of his name 
name means denial response because this individual did not take time out to look at both sides of the issue and he's pushing this toxin on us and uh, it, it's wrong and I had to say something and I went there and I said what I had to say. Of course a lot of people were astounded that I would say something like that about a, a, a pediatrician within our community but you know you got to get angry once in a while and just tell them what you think. It's nice to be soft and bring the information to them but sometimes you just get you just got to tell them oh, just like that. Denial response that's all you know about fluoride just you know if the mantra is safe and effective forget about it you know you, you, you got to get angry sometimes in a controlled manner and tell them how you feel you got to get emotional about it sometimes because if, if not if you're monotone they have to say you believe it you feel it it oozes from you it, it's something that that you're gonna fight until you you can't breathe anymore oh my god yes it has affected my family oh my god my wife is upset my, my daughter knows about it and, and she's in fact I was holding signs one time with that fluoride sign <laughs> uh, fluoride's toxic two thousand dollars she charge I was holding signs by myself out and one of her girlfriend's mothers picked her up and uh, they stopped at the stop sign right across from me and the mother said I wonder who that guy is and my daughter slid down in the seat she wouldn't say that's my dad so yeah I, I guess I can embarrass you know she was younger then and embarrass some people out there holding signs and, and doing this because sometimes I might be the only one there sometimes there might be 10 people there but no matter who's there you just have to stand up you know people have cursed at me from holding that sign some people said I'm stupid all I say is collect the money collect the two thousand dollars that's all I want you to do yeah I mean you get abused but hey that that's what life's about standing up for what you believe in and taking the abuse and, and, and doing the best you can with it but standing up and being counted is important people call me an idiot you don't know what you're talking about you know people like you shouldn't be in our community it, it goes on and on like that there are so many negative people out there that will just abuse you but you can't give up you keep fighting and uh, you keep moving on and for the people you, you do find they, they almost become your friends you know I mean you don't see them that often but you have a common bond and a common cause that's right and just and that's what makes it all worth it you have to believe it why would they do this they're not getting any money I'm not getting any money none of us are getting any money we're just spending it and we're putting ourselves under the gun all the time and so we're, we're getting nothing except trying to help our community First tonight, hazmat crews from all across our area responded to a chemical leak this afternoon in Rock Island. The chemical was so strong that it was burning through the concrete there. News 8's Christy Mergenthal has the latest. It was just before 1 o'clock Thursday afternoon when hazmat crews were called to the Rock Island water treatment plant for a chemical spill coming from this tanker truck. The chemical hydrofluoral sicilic acid is used to add fluoride to the plant's water. After several hours, crews were able to clean up the leak, allowing operations to return to normal. They had to court off the area obviously but as far as uh, the treatment of the water and the, the amount of water uh, you know being used by the public there's no effect on that at all. Now that acid that did spill out is a chemical that they actually use every single day here at the water treatment plant it adds fluoride to the water.